Welcome to the Great Bays Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith, along with Andres Barbosa. Fortunate to have him as our guest tonight. Number 102. After 100, we were going to get together with our fact checker. Andres is our fact checker. He has listened to our podcast. Many, many things. Um, let's get into his background. But first of all, we're in Boynton Beach. We're at the FM Tennis Performance Center. Great to have Andres here. Tell us a little bit about your background, your beginning days in tennis. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, I started in tennis here when I was a little kid in Miami. Moved here at the age of five. Probably started picking up a racket with my dad at a local park by my school. My dad's a former high-level soccer player. Knew nothing about tennis, so we just go out there. A Brazilian. A Brazilian. That was a, he did always talk to me about Maria Bueno. That's the only one I remember that he would always. But that was a, the extent of his knowledge in tennis until Guga came around. But, uh, you know, went to high school in Miami, played college tennis at Florida International. Was a mediocre player on that team to below average, but uh, have a group of guys on that team that... Uh, 28 years later, we're still the closest of friends. We get together every weekend, play locally, and have a great time. I was fortunate that you, you brought several of your teammates to hang out with us. Oh, they loved it. They still, uh, we still talk about it all the time. So Gustavo is, uh, Gustavo Alba is my closest friend since I was 12 years old. Uh, Fabian Heller is a guy that I met in 94. Um, Work with his kids a little bit in tennis. Uh, he's just a great guy. And Federico de Petris is living in Argentina, but his son comes down here once a year. I brought him up last year for the first time, and just a great group of guys, great families, just great people all around. So, and people say they play college tennis here all the time is greatest time of their life in college tennis. Yeah, I did. You know, I, I had an accident in my the beginning of my junior year. I got knocked off a moped. And I had a frontal hematoma, and I wasn't cleared to play pretty much again. But, you know, that was in 97. So what is that, 25 years later, we're still uh, have a group chat that goes on and, you know, they send 50 messages a day. Like, you would think we have nothing better to do in our day, but a uh, great group of guys, and I love them dearly. And Jay Berger was your coach at Florida International. Jay was our assistant. He was a volunteer assistant. Uh, he was, I guess, finishing up his degree. And Peter Lehman uh, was my coach. So he's still coaching locally in Miami. He's, uh, as far as I know, he's still the boys and girls coach at Ransom High School. Okay. And great guy. Uh, you know, he's a, my brother was very affiliated with the University of Miami the athletic departments and Peter was a massive hurricane fan. So, you know, he's, he's always good to, to catch up with at football games. Yeah. Your brother, JD, I tell some of the stories. He was a mascot for the university of Miami. Yeah, some great stories. Don't say it too loud. He likes to pretend like it's a secret identity that he doesn't like to share too much, but it might be out of the cat might be out of that bag. Yeah. Well, Jay Berger, he played for Chuck Reese. You guys must've done a lot of running. So basically when I got in, Jay was kind of like finishing up. So the class before me was when they really dealt with Jay. They dealt with Jay as far as the dress code on, on travel days, everything. I mean, every little detail they had, it, they had to put up with. It was quite the taskmaster from what everybody tells me. But from when I was there, it became a very much that all the principals stayed there, the 520 mile, the you know it was the amount of running that we did was insane, but we had a very international team. Um, we might have had three guys from Miami. I like to say that I was was there to bring up the GPA for the team, but uh, but it, it it was you know we had guys from Brazil, from Spain, from Argentina, from Italy. We had them from everywhere. So you know. Dorm life was quite interesting. You got to experience a lot of uh, different culture. What did you uh, study? I majored in finance. I was going to guess English because you've uh, been an editor for us, uh, looking at all our 
content and calm you up. You know me, I like to I like to needle you, but uh, your memory is impressive. I, I hope my memory is as good as yours in next week, let alone uh, 20 years. No, but your uh, command of the English language. Your mother's Colombian. What was the language of the household? Uh, language of the household was Spanish. And yeah. if you're my father, you try to combine three languages. You speak a little Portuguese, a little little Spanish, and a little English. My first language is Portuguese. When I, I was born in D.C., my family was working at the, at the embassy. And the first language I learned was Portuguese. Once I moved to Miami, my father was determined that we didn't grow up with accents. So he only spoke to us in English. He was worried that... It, in Miami would be discriminated against if we had an accent. So little did he know that it, you know, 40 years later, nobody in Miami would be speaking uh, King's English. So it's, uh, yeah, I can't complain. My dad still though, is still suffering with uh, three languages. He can throw all three in one sentence. So you played junior tennis and college tennis. After college, did you go straight into coaching? So after my accident, um, I pretty much started slowly working in tennis. I, my, one of my junior coaches, uh, Pat Collasso, he brought me in. Uh, I started just being the jack of all trades. I'd kind of do, I'd string rackets, I'd fill in for clinics, I'd hit with any, you know, he was pretty much bringing me in. And and then slowly I started picking up uh, different people as far as hitting partner. And as time went on, I was just going up and observing other coaches giving lessons. I vividly remember, you know, studying like alongside like a Rodney Harmon. He was the coach at UM at that time. I'd go watch his lessons with my players. I had a few players that were taking lessons with him. Um, from after that, Francisco Montana. Uh, senior father. Um, he was a great influence in my life. He was a great, great guy. Um, his son, Francisco, Kiko, one of my closest friends now. Um, who else? Let's go down. I don't want to leave anybody out here. I had a lot of, I had a lot of personalities that were tennis, that were great influences, uh, just great people to talk to. One of my teammates in college, was Jaime Fiol. His father was top 10, I want to say, like maybe in the, in the 70s. Yeah, great player. And Movie star, good looks. And I mean, and a better person. I mean, I, I spent a week at his house in Chile. And interestingly enough, Nicholas Jari uh, is his grandson. He must have been 18 months to two years old when I was down there. And I, I vividly remember him walking around with a, a huge racket with two hands and just uh, swinging at a ball just in the in in the playroom. It was, and now I see him. He's like six foot seven, and it's crazy where the years went. Just you and your brother, no other siblings. And JD, um, did he play tennis as well? So my brother played tennis until he was about twelve years old, and then he didn't like it. He said. I'd rather play baseball. He went off and played baseball. He was a pretty good baseball player. He wrestled too, right? Then he wrestled. He was like a jack of all trades. And then he, when he got to UM, you know, he really became the intramural king. He basically dedicated himself to every sport in intramurals. And he's a very good athlete. He's a, but then around that time is when he picked up his love for tennis again. And that's, uh, you know, he still wants to say that he can beat me one day. I think that's still his goal, but. It's not happening yet. His wrestling helped him. One of the stories, um, it's too bad it's not on YouTube, but University of Miami is playing in Florida. Tell me if I've got it wrong. Yeah, so you the, got it right. The gator comes up, pushes him, and then he uses his high school wrestling technique. It was 100,000 uh, people in the stadium. And he's well, he's he, dressed like a duck, and he's standing on the alligator with his fist in the air. Well, he's, he's, most his known, web. he's most known for what happened after, later in that game, when he got the penalty. But... Um, in the first half, yeah, the Gator came on his side. He kept pointing and saying, stay on your side. Guy walked over and then just tackled the Gator. And it was my first memory of a text message. I had a, my Nokia phone. And basically, I just remember receiving 50 text messages. Was that your brother? Was that your brother? 
I was in the uh, Superdome, is it, in New Orleans, and it was great. So then after the game, he, he had the famous penalty that was referred to in that 30 for 30 on ESPN, and he was miserable the rest of the weekend. But they lost because of the penalty. No, no, they won. They oh, won they handily. Won. They won handily. They just didn't inform him of the rule for that game so that we're all out in New Orleans that, that night having a great time, and he's miserable because he thinks he's going to get fired on Monday morning. Well, what was the penalty? So basically at the Orange Bowl, he used to run on the field and hug the players that were his buddies. And, you know, there was no penalty. But apparently earlier in the week in New Orleans, they said that will not be allowed. And anybody that runs on the field, it's a 15-yard penalty. So... You know, he runs on the field. I forgot who it was that scored, but it was a buddy of his. Ran on the field. He gave him a hug. They threw the flag. Then they zoom into to Butch Davis. Uh, I'll keep it clean so that uh, Andy doesn't have to. Uh, Andy Fitzell doesn't have to censor this. But he goes, you know, get that, get that bird off the field. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, that Monday he had to go into his office. He was worried he was going to get fired. And. Butch Davis, a quality guy, he goes over and he apologizes to him, saying, I'm sorry for doing that to you in public. Um, you know, took a picture with him, asked him to sign it. In my brother's eyes, it was his favorite. And then a couple days later, Butch Davis was not persona non grata in Miami because he went off to Cleveland to coach the Browns. So, but he's A-OK -okay in my brother's book, as far as I know. JD, the mascot. And you and your brother circled back and eventually you got in business together. Yeah, so now uh, when he graduated, he was um, you know, tinkering with the idea of getting into tennis. Uh, Francisco back then had uh, the contract to Dante Fassell Park, and we all started there. And then we went off to Tropical Park for about 15 years. Uh, a little bit of time in between there at Crandon Park. And yeah, right now we're at uh, Candletown. So yeah, things are good, can't complain. With uh, Andres is a tennis junkie. With, uh, let's go through the thought on, fa on, on fact checking. Well, you know, when I, when I first met you. Actually, uh, we can circle back. Why don't you tell us how you, first of all, you, before we get into fact checking, We've had 100 podcasts, actually 101. So we, we talked about doing it after 100 or after two years. But yeah, why don't you tell the listeners how you get connected with uh, Great Base? So for years, I used to travel to weekend tournaments all the time with juniors. And you know, I've had kids now from that graduate high school back as the first batch that graduated was about 2012. And I remember being in Lakeland and Erica Oosterhout, or Oosterhout maybe? Out, yeah. She was playing against uh, Emma Peterson, a girl that, uh, a student of mine that ended up going to James Madison, was the all-time winningest player at James Madison. And I remember watching the first round and a, just a phenomenal match. Emma lost like six and five. I saw this girl, I'd never seen her play before, never heard of her. And later on in the day, I went off and I was speaking to Rachel Rohrbacher's father, Lynn. Lynn, right. And I knew that Rachel worked with you in the past. I think at that time she was actually working with a buddy of mine from, from Miami, Alex Golub. She and did towards the end of her junior career. Because I, I had left the Tampa area. I was there to 15 years. I, I coached Rachel maybe from the time she was eight. Yeah, I saw it on all the tennis intelligence applied. I see her featured quite I, readily. She she just finished a couple years ago, played yeah, at South Carolina. Carolina. They were yep. top five in the country. She's a great person. I used to love watching because she was very friendly with all the girls. That uh, Yeah, great personality. So basically the father told me that Erica also worked with you. And I was like, Jesus, I mean, this guy's got everybody. And... So that was really the the impetus to kind of go out there and meet you. And you know, I think I told you once, uh, I think you were writing in a, in a magazine or newsletter of some sort. 
Yeah, I've written for different magazines. And And on the bottom, you had your phone number and your email address. One thing with going back. I called you and I basically said, I'm coming over. One thing with Erica, um, she played soccer. One thing that really helped was her father taught high school physics. So that's always a plus because tennis, it's physics first. And her mother was a lawyer. But she was just really, I think, you know, at that time studying and had to pass her after completing her studies, uh, then taking the, the bar exam. But we taught the mother to teach the daughter. She's, Erica would be on tennis intelligence applied. But she played soccer, then she was injured. So she hadn't played junior tennis. She, she chose soccer eventually. But then she had a, a knee operation. She went to Harvard. She was a freshman of the year. That's a, that's a pretty good commercial for the the Great Bays. The, the, the mother did so much of the teaching. I remember I remember seeing the mother there. Um, I don't remember ever speaking to her. That, like I said, I'd never seen the girl before, but I was just taken aback at how good she was. So, yeah. So then, basically, I I remember driving over to you on a Saturday morning. You were in Tampa. I think we went to Moe's. For lunch, and then uh, you know the rest is history. Actually, I oh, you've been to visit so many so many times now. And yeah, then I've been in Miami, and you've helped us out so much. Uh, you know, your parents have a home in Miami that you know many times they're in Colombia, and we've had players uh, stay at that second home. Yeah, the, the, we had Victor that year; he won the Orange Bowl, and you know, I remember uh, during the final, I said, Andres, why do you come? We we talked to Victor, and I said, Victor. If you lose, it's not going to be. It's not going to change. If if you lose, we're going to leave, and I'm going to give you a hard time. If you win, we're going to leave, and I'm going to give you a hard time. And actually, one of the great things about that, Steve Roberts, who's been a guest on our podcast, he brought a group of kids in, and we did a camp at um, Tropical Park, where you and your brother at that time were running Tropical Park. And after the Orange Bowl, after a sandwich at Subway. Um, Victor Lova just won the Orange Bowl, and Steve Roberts brought like a six, seven-year-old girl at a complete Western grip, and that's an old facility, Tropical Park, and you have a, the uh, the light poles are square, right? And you know, here's a guy, you know, he's, no more than two hours earlier he had won the Orange Bowl, and he's teaching a six, seven-year-old, you know, how to change the grip by putting the the racket against the square wall, the square tele, the square light post, and just going up and down, up and down. I, I remember him being on the wall at Salvador Park, like after his matches and going out there and helping kids on the wall. So yeah, with uh, no, he's still at it. Um, you know, he he was with us for five years, so we haven't worked with him in a couple of years now. But actually, Carla Wojcik, I just call her Navarro, her maiden name. She one time was in charge of the practice. Uh, partners for the Delray Beach Open. And Victor, you know, 16 or so, he's obviously good enough to practice with the pros. And she, she um, said, Victor, I need to have you do me a favor. And she said, I'd like to have you teach for just 30 minutes. And so he started to teach, and, and she very cleverly said, uh, that was fun to watch. You still teach the way you were taught. I was a good kid. I remember, we were, was it last year now that he got to the finals of uh, Junior Wimbledon? Yeah. I texted his uh, his uncle because he's a great guy. Uh, he spent some time. At, he stayed at your weeks. place. Yeah, yeah. spent a few weeks, and so he got to know him well. And he lives lives. You know, at that time he was living in Spain. In Spain, correct. So he could speak uh, Bulgarian. He could speak Spanish fluently. I was impressed. He spoke better than I did. With Victor, um, anybody who talks to him, he really knows tennis history. I was with him at a USTA function, where. Brian Godfrey was speaking to the players. I mean, Brian Godfrey was fact checker, French Open finalist, number three in the world. I know you'll look that up. Uh, but with that... I'll kick you under the table if I... With, with uh, Brian said to us, he goes, I'm so impressed that uh, Victor knows I was in the French Open final. I said, well, he also knows what the score was. <laughs> and then he goes, well, don't make him repeat that. It was Vilas who beat him pretty soundly in straight sets. We have to look that up. But Borg is playing, was playing world team tennis the year that V lost. I have to look all this up. My fact checker is yeah. here. I know we one thing we talk about the French Open. Uh, you 
told me that I said uh, that Lindsay Davenport won the French, and you told me that she hadn't won it. One of the reasons that's on my mind is I I remember reading this and hearing this, that both Agassiz and Davenport had won titles on clay. I guess it wasn't both on the French, but they neither one of them could slide. I think, but you were thinking of Sharapova, not the... Uh... No, no, but those two, there's a, I don't think the story is that, no, either. Yeah, Sharapova actually said that... Uh, who won the French Open twice, she said, I move, you gotta love this about your poor. Um, I, I move like a fat cow on ice, you know, with, but no, I think it was at one time, and they're pretty much the same age group, correct? Where Davenport and Agassi were lumped together, like these, these two, have, they can't slide on clay. Um, it's interesting, you know, Agassi, he won the national 14s before he went to Bradenton, work with Nick. And people just thought that, that he would just dominate on the clay. Eventually, eventually won the French Open, but um, yeah, he, he wasn't really the best mover on clay. Yeah, I've heard a lot of the Agassi stories and Courier stories from Kiko over the years. When it was crazy to think about how great that group was that he that he grew up with. With Agassi, his sister Tammy, fighter, she over she fought cancer, cancer survivor, but she also. After playing at Tyler Junior College, which is which is an immigration center for foreign players, won so many national championships. She played at A and M, but she didn't hit the ball anything like her brother. It's kind of interesting, you know. Then you, you find out about the the ball machine story. Yeah, that's always a story I wanted you to to expand upon because I know you've talked about how Agassi himself taught himself how to hit the ball because of the speed of the ball machine. I know you say force to force. But I never really understood. Uh, I know you have to spend a lot of time around Andy. With you'll have to keep me on track here. I don't want to digress, but uh, there was a, just a great—I'd call it a trailer, like for a movie. The Tennis Channel put it together for Vic Braden, and right away I sent a text to Scott Perelman, who was a guest on our podcast, Scotty Perelman, with, um, and then Young Agassi. There's. They see it, show him, and he's, he's on that. There's just so many connections. But with with Mike Agassi, wrote his book first. Andre, his book second. Um, but anyway, Pearl Scott Perelman, he did a little skit on this film, Braden, called Tennis Etiquette, and he was the darty mongoose. So you see a guy with an afro, and no shirt, and a big hat, sunglasses, and a cigar. That's Scott Perelman. It's it, just look it up on YouTube. Tennis Story, Vic Braden, Tennis Channel, three minutes and seventeen seconds. Very optimistic that they hit, they did they hit a home yeah, run with that. It looks, it looks, it looks exciting. That you know, so many of us have been concerned on what's going to happen with the archive. But the, back to the ball machine, I told Scotty. Uh, we then we ended up talking. I said, you need to listen to one of our podcasts where Gideon Ariel, Vic's partner, you know, leading biomechanist. So this ties into the question with Agassi and the ball machine. A great time to work with someone is when they're really you really want to teach technique. Get someone really fatigued. First of all, Jim Larry used to always say that they're gasping for air, and kids listen more when they're <sighs> after they've done some sprints or what have you. But Mike Agassi, Bellman was at a Chicago hotel. Then he Agassi's the youngest of four. They go to, go to Las Vegas. He's on a mission. He buys a house. You know, it's in, it's in his book where he's walking into the front of the house with a real, realtor, and he, next thing you know, he's walking around the house, and the realtor says, Mike, let's go in and look at the inside of the house. And he went, he goes, I want to see the backyard first. So he measured off the backyard. And the story goes he never saw the inside of the house. The, the house was big enough. The man on a mission to put a tennis court in the backyard. So he's the youngest of four. The other siblings didn't have the ball machine training that the young one did, Andre. And the, the dad's theory was to just send the ball as fast as possible. So coming back to getting aerial, you know, ground reaction force. You know, if you listen to Vic with that, or excuse me, not so much on Vic, but if you listen to the podcast on getting aerial, you can just tell you know, how much he helped Vic Braden. So, to, you know, um, you got to counter speed with speed. So the ball's coming in fast. So Agassi, he learned to keep the racket up high. Wait, 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 trigger the energy, and then let the racket free, free fall. He, through that experience, he got as far away from the ball as possible. You know, a lot of this is okay, in my opinion, to speculate. 
but also too is how I, I don't think I've seen anyone who use their legs better when they get set and how Agassi would just snap his body upward like someone throwing a medicine ball. Um, and, you know, what a clean striker of the ball. Yeah, phenomenal, the forehand and backhand. Yeah, and, and Braden said one time, we have this on film, said, you know, Andre, and this is what I like about players. They're so honest. He said, Andre, you get your, your opponent's so far out of the court, why don't you come in and volley? And he said, have you seen me volley? With, you know, Steve Denton was in town last week. He was playing against Christine and... Agassi went time and to intimidate them. There were young guys coming on the tour. The story is that he caught the ball. I mean, repeating myself, if you go back to that podcast, but it all comes down to ball striking. You know, the guys get to toss way over their head and they don't really have a first serve. But with Andre, um, yeah, the 2,500 balls a day is quite a bit. And, yeah. you know, if he'd started that age four, age five, you know. That ball catching story reminds me of when he caught the ball in the Davis Cup match against uh, Argentina, against Haiti. Martin Haiti. Yeah. yeah, I coached the kid, Ruben Perchek, went three sets with him in the Orange Bowl. He was a great player. I thought it was original back then. I didn't realize that Steve Denton had done it before him. So. Yeah. No, Tyriac, uh player gets really upset and he hits the ball in the stands, his opponent. And Back in the day, okay, here they're, they're playing with three balls, and they switch three balls, three balls. So the guy hits a ball out of the stadium. You know, Tyriac catches the guy, then the guy hits his serve. Tyriac catches it, and he hits it, and he hits that ball in the stands. He goes, "What are we gonna do now?" <laughs> just to totally, you know, stop the audience and go, "Whoa!" And just he is gonna be the king of intimidation. That would be one guy to get on a podcast. That that guy must have stories uh, for days. Yeah, I've heard Pam Shriver say he can say I'm innocent in 14 languages. His first billionaire in sport, played ice hockey for Romania as a black belt in karate. I mean, go on and on about Tyriac. He, um, I remember my brother was the assistant coach for the Rangers. I remember being a gopher, and I got to go to all these closed practices because I would go in and hand these guys tickets to the to a Broadway show or whatever. I remember watching Tyriac coach Vilas. But Tyriac, at one time, the rumor was that he was going to do um, be a commentator on American TV. Um, I never heard that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think of so many things with Tyriac. What he said about Mackinac one time, he said he needs to go to France, play the amateur tournaments, play he's lefty, so play right-handed and learn not to be a shot maker, you know, just learn defense. And then, you know, Borg and, uh, came around, and, I mean, Borg was on the scene, he's a little bit older than Mackinac, and Mackinac says that he learned defense by obviously having to play Borg. Yeah, you can just ramble on, but Tyriac, what a character. That's another guy that speaks Spanish better than I do. He's uh, he's fluent. Tyriac? Yeah. I heard him uh, when he was, he owned the tournament in Madrid. Yeah, the blue they clay courts. They interviewed him a few times, and he's, Spanish is great. Yeah. Well, tell us what your thoughts are on fact-checking. I mean, I do have to say this. That I know that Bill Russell, we have another gentleman who, uh, Enjoys the podcast, thankfully, and I know it was Bill Russell that who won eleven titles out of thirteen. But just whether it's being a senior moment, um, brain cramp, long day on the tennis court, but uh, I do say some things that if I, someone's asked, I'll, I'll be able to correct myself. Pretty good. I mean, you're ninety eight percent, ninety eight point nine percent accurate. So I have total recall. I can recall totally what I want to. Yeah, I can't complain, honestly. <laughs> just an excuse to give you a call and give you a little grief so it's uh just all in fun with um you asked a question about dr alex mayer before we came on air uh both sons um new jersey we have a student assistant who's from new jersey i give him a hard time all the time for being from new jersey he could be from nebraska I just give him a hard time not, not because he's from new jersey <laughs> but Two, two players in the top 10 in the world. Now, I one time spoke on the phone with Dr. Alex Mayer. Uh, was the possibility of working for him. I never got a chance to work for him, but I did spend a lot of time with the late George Basho. He was, you know, Bill Tim was the voice of the USTA. But, I mean, I think people would agree that George Basho was the backbone of the USPTA at one time. So dedicated. And for a long time, he worked as a school teacher. Mr. Teaching Aid, George Basho. Uh, I was at the National Teachers Conference, and I asked George Basho because Alex it was uh, Gene Mayer. Gene Mayer was, they both were top 10 in the world. And 
I just raised my hand and said, well, if the brothers were brought up under a system, Doc, there's Alex, what's Sandy and Gene? So Sandy and Gene, both top 10 in the world, they brought up in a system, why do they play so differently? And George Bezos started walking backwards and he said, Gene, why don't you answer that? And Gene Mayer said, well, I was so good when I was in the 12s, I could entertain myself. And that's the way he played, he had all sorts of angles and drop volleys and topspin lobs. And Billy Martin, who arguably was one of the best juniors ever, coach at UCLA, Gene Mayer said, I beat him 6-0, 6-0 in a 12 and under final. With um, when Gene Mayer was at Stanford, Dick Gould, think, you know, so clever, won 17 national championships. He told Gene when he came in, he goes, at this level, you can't hit two hands on both sides, so you're going to pick one. And he thought that he would convert to a one-handed forehand. But what he did in college is he hit slice. Sure. And then, then he started using Prince rackets, and then Prince was saying, here's, here's a guy who has just jumped up to be in the top ten in the world because of Prince racket." But what that wasn't the case is that in college, he played with a slice backhand, one-handed slice. And then when he left Stanford, he started playing two hands on both sides again. That's why he jumped up in the rankings. The name, uh, the story that I remember is actually, I can't remember the year now, but I believe it was, they must have been, one of them must have been in their mid-40s. And they played a challenger match against... The God. brothers? One of the brothers played a singles match against the defending NCAA champion. And I see now I'm gonna now I have to fact check myself, but I want to say it was uh, Cedric Kaufman from uh, Kentucky. He's a coach, yeah. And I want to say that it was either he lost to lost to one of the brothers, or it was seven five in the third. And I remember McEnroe saying, "How's this possible? I you know, I used to beat those guys." So. Cedric Kaufman, I think his claim to fame, we have to fact check this, is he went five sets with Sanders, Sampras at the French. French. So turn the clock ahead a little bit. That must have been the match. It must have been like a few weeks before that, that he yeah. either lost or barely beat the mayor. And it was that probably the first time I'd ever heard of the guy. Yeah, I know. He, he's coaching at Kentucky. Uh, we should talk to Brian Draxel. He'd be great to get on our podcast. His son, Leem's a great competitor, smile on his face, just loves tennis. But here's a story when you say it's Cedric Kaufman. Mike Costa, I keep waiting for him, big, tall, good-looking guy to make the silver screen. He's on national commercials. He's been on national TV shows. Tennis Channel's trying to feature him pretty... Yeah, that's right. He's on the Tennis Channel. So I remember telling him, he's from Michigan, I said, you really should study, with your comedic talents, you really should study the Vic Braden system. Because he has, you know, I know the USTA has hired him to do this and do that, and... So anyway, Raven Claussen, we're all big fans of Raven. He spent five years with us. And I wanted to have someone coach him who, if I get this right, three things. That they didn't play college tennis because college tennis players are just catered to. And then also that um, over the age of 25. And then also, too, not to have an American. You know, I get myself in trouble here, but to have someone who... Um, you know, I think we Americans in tennis have a tendency to be a little bit spoiled. You know, hey, we don't want to go here. We don't want to go there. You know, you want to have somebody who will we'll, we'll go wherever we need to go. And we'll stay there for as long as possible. And we won't miss ESPN. Yeah, so we're, you don't need a Starbucks nearby. Starbucks. Yeah, I mean, a lot of top, top tennis players, you know, they, they said, well, I can't stay in Europe that long. I have to come back because I want to watch, you know, football games or whatever. So... Based in Tampa, there's a Futures in Orlando. Luke Wickham, one of another longtime friend of ours, great guy. He also he was a Vic Braden coach. He's my real estate coach now. So anyway, Raven, I go up for the first round. Costa was out of the qualies. So Costa ends up being the coach for Raven Class. I should say their traveling partner. And I think I've said this story before because. Maybe, maybe when we're talking to Raven, he's a guest on our podcast. So for you people like yourself who've listened to every podcast, I apologize. So anyway, the stories are worth, I think, worth hearing the second time. How's it go? Short story long, long story short. This was okay. This was... So Kaufman, um, here's a guy who's gone five sets. That's the buzzword at a 15,000 future. So I go up after the first round, 
and you know, Raiden's gonna play Kaufman in the second round. And I said, Costa, you're supposed to chart. And he's walking, he's an extra, he's walking around, he's got ice on his shoulder, and he's a life of the party. And I go, I'm coming back tomorrow, you need to chart the match. So I come back and he's, you know, he's with the trainer, he's not, not icing the match. And I said, uh, and he was playing doubles, which they won a couple of futures, and he was playing doubles with Raven. And I said, uh, you're fired. I go, he goes, what do you mean? I go, you're not playing doubles with Raven anymore. He laughed. He thought I, he, he thought I was kidding or I had no control in that situation, but he never played doubles with Raven after that. But Cedric Hoffman, I, I don't know how many years he's been in um, Kentucky. Wasn't it uh, Dennis Emery that was the coach before? Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember spending time with him at a junior tournament in Mexico because he was there with his son, Matt. Vaguely remember his name. Yeah. A good guy. I remember having a good time with Dennis. I, I was introduced to him before. I really never, never knew Dennis. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Doc, Dr. Mayer, his, his Sandy was more, I think, old school tennis. And you could see where he was taught more by his father. But, you know, there's, there's some of the training that I heard from George Basho that I thought was great. I remember seeing Jimmy Everett have kids do this at Holiday Park. You know, they had a backboard with the tennis court on both sides, basically. So instead of having a net, it was just a backboard, and he'd had kids lob over the backboard. Hmm. But Gene Mayer, um, Dr. Alex Mayer, developed a contraption on the top of the garage. George Basho told me this, so that the kid's like a, a kid throwing a baseball, wants to play catch by himself, throws the baseball, the ball rolls down. What a brilliant idea. So the, the kid has to lift up. When a kid, you, you drive through the neighborhood and some kid is innocently hitting the garage door, it's good for hand-eye coordination, it's good for skill development, but not for form development, not for technique, because they're gonna have horizontal swings against a low backboard. Backboard should be really high. Another thing too is he would go, put himself up in a balcony and see if the kids could hit up to where he was on the balcony. You know, just ideas like that. I think that's what's great about studying tennis is you, know, you can learn from anybody and everybody. You gotta really be open to learning. Well, the interesting, uh the part that I liked about the tennis channel with the Vic Braden uh, videos that are coming out is they showed, you know, little clips of uh, Jack Kramer and Pancho Gonzalez and Lou Hode and Rod Laver. And it just reminded me, like, for years, uh, Patricio Pe and Patricio Rodriguez, Pato Pe and uh, Pato Rodriguez, they used to run... Uh, the Prince Cup, and then it became like the Copa. Sport Goofy, Air maybe? Corp no, no, no. It was the Prince Cup, and it became like the Copa Airlines Cup. And okay, we okay, to, okay, yeah. We, yeah, used yeah. To host it, we used to host it for them at Tropical, and then basically before they used to do it out at what now is uh, the Mikasuki Resort. It used to be called Kendall Lakes. but uh, So I used to sit with them regularly, and we, there's a little Chilean restaurant uh, right there on, by the park, and they were just phenomenal. Sit down and have stories with you know. They would talk about their time with Hopman, you know, when they had to go, when they were playing. You know, there must have been seventeen on the Davis Cup team for Chile, and then basically talking about the the practices and going out for long runs afterwards, and then just great guys to hear. You know, in a guy like Pato Rodriguez's case, you had. I know he was with Jose Luis Clerc. I know he was with Gomez when he won the, the French. I know he was with uh, Lapenti. I know he was with um, Masu when he won the gold medal. So you're talking about a guy that's seen almost every player in 50 years. And, you know, it was interesting when, when I asked those guys who was the best they had ever seen. Uh, I now I might get it backwards, but uh, I know one of them said Laver and the other one said Emerson. So it's kind of fascinating that, you know, guys that were coaching against the Federers, the Sampras's, the McEnroe's, you know, the Connors, the Borg, everybody, those were the ones that just stood out to them. So it's to me it's interesting how tennis is the one sport that just completely disrespects the history of tennis. Like oh, I, no... yeah, it's, I'm glad you, glad you mentioned that. You know, growing up in ice hockey, no one would ever say, for example, the great Bobby Orr he couldn't play today. Right. You know, kids do look at YouTube clips, and definitely with the wooden rackets, uh, they were hitting the ball with less speed. 
the skill level. You know, you know, and if you go from, I like to tell kids this, um, 1954, Rosewall was in the Wimbledon final. 1974, he's in the Wimbledon final, playing Connors. And Connors didn't go out to 94, but in 1991, he was knocking on the door to be in another Grand Slam final. There's two players, 40 years. And then you could, then you say, well, let's add Agassi to the mix. These people, and I think people have long careers. It's, it's almost a safe bet that they stay really close to the baseline. Well, um, yeah, you know, I just, I hope that with this tennis channel, with all this video that they have, that they really touch on that because... You know, it's just it's just crazy to think that you know uh, like for instance I was telling one of the kids the other day that I was a huge V Launder fan as a kid. And they of course go on YouTube and they go, oh, that guy couldn't play today. And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, that guy's backhand was phenomenal. He was an all court player even when he was before his great year in '88. I mean, if you look at any clip, very comfortable up at net. He's an all court player, and then. Elon is a great story. 82, fact checker, 82, he wins the French, 88. He didn't win Wimbledon, but um, I believe he won three, and then three of the main main tournaments, Grand Slams. But he did win on grass. He won the Australian. But it's like if you go back and look at Yannick Noah or you look at Richard Krychek, I mean, it looks just like a Braden surf. Right. You know. um, Or Kevin Curran at Wimbledon when he played Becker. Yeah, I mean... I mean, if you really look at even Curios today, you know, we were talking to Steve Denton just a couple, this last week. The mechanics of Steve Denton are very similar to, because it's just physics. I mean, really loose, just like a baseball pitcher. And actually in that trailer, they show Vic. Um, you know, what Vic would do with a tennis racket is he would just take a racket and just turn like a baseball pitcher, toss it, and just swing the racket. You know, because so many people to this day, they get in tennis and they've heard, you know, down together, up together, scratch the back, toss high for more time. I believe in one of the podcasts uh, we've we've covered miss. But V-Launder, you know, we get a little bit tired. Um, we hear people say, are you a great baser? I mean, we're going to change it to solid fundamentals. But, you know, the name comes from Richard Hernandez saying years ago, tennis needs a great base initiative. Kids are... I mean, I mean, just at the national 16s, national 18s, I was at the national 12s, watched a bunch of matches. And unfortunately, it's way too many kids don't understand grip, swing, body. You know, fundamentals are not being taught. You know, it's, I mean, going back to what we were talking about earlier about my, the start of my coaching career, I mean, I, I was pretty fortunate, I think, to be around some, some great minds, right? Like where, you know, Rodney was a great guy, great guy to talk to. Francisco basically treated me like part of his family. And, you know, they would be very analytical into tennis, but it wasn't really until I met you that I really, it was very clear. It was very clear in like, uh, on how to go out there and, and go step by step. So, you know, I had, probably a lot of success with kids that I started playing tennis. I don't know, it was probably as early as like 2004, 2005, maybe earlier. But I would, in hindsight, I'm going to say it was all because of hours spent on a court. Whereas now I feel like it's a lot more efficient where I can get anybody that's starting to play tennis and get them on the right track right away. Which is interesting because I've heard you say numerous times about how you can lose someone, you know, if they if they don't notice the improvement, remote, you know, relatively quickly, you lose them. So I just feel like now it's anybody that walks in the door, you get them on the right path in a matter of days. So, you know, it's a it's a credit to your efforts to go out there and really express the teachings of Vic of uh, of Welby of. Harry Hopman, you know, of all the coaches of Jim Verdick and all the coaches that you've mentioned, Dennis Vandermeer, I don't want to leave anybody out. I know there's eight pillars, but uh, yeah. it doesn't come out as quickly on camera now. But, uh, you know, it really does, you know, help the quality of teaching. Now I've actually been enjoying going out and trying to help others improve their teaching. You know, obviously to a lesser extent is what you're doing, but, um, you know, just trying to package it in a way where it's interesting to the to 
the non tennis holic. You know, let's say like a guy like you and I might be lifers and can be in it all day, all night. You know, you might have to package it a little bit differently for someone that has a limited shelf life, let's say, for concentration on tennis on the day. So I have enjoyed that. With teaching, um, I'm Rodney Harmon. I know he's a coach at Georgia Tech. He recently was the president of the PTR. He played at Irvine under Greg Patton, I believe. And he transferred to SMU where he played under Dennis Ralston. Got to quarterfinals of the US Open. And then transferred again, right? He went to Tennessee after? I could be wrong. I may, maybe he wasn't at Irvine. I, no, actually, that's where I need you, my fact See checker. I, I saw him play tennis uh, at Irvine. I went to the match. I saw him play college tennis. So he didn't play. It was Tennessee. Thanks. Fan, the fans fact checker. Here, see fact checker in fact action. Fact checker in action. So, yeah, I've got to be careful here, um, especially as I get older. But one time, um, you know, he was just promoted within the USTA, and he was put in charge of, I'm not sure what the title was, uh, the people who, there was one per section, so there were 17, and we had three former trainees that all worked for the USTA, and they were one of the, you know, with a, obviously a different section. And the role was to go to the schools. They did assembly, pro, did assembly programs. But I can remember he was in charge, and he was very honest. He said, this is all new to me. And it was a training session for the 17, and so, you know, I, I got a chance to go to that is because I had three students that were, were doing that. So I know that he I do remember went that. back and forth with the USTA, back and forth in college tennis. So when I first met him, he was the men's coach at UM. I mean, he had a, I don't know if it was his first recruiting class or not, but it was, I just remember the Michael Russell, Yvonne Rodrigo recruiting class. And those guys were great. I remember spending some time with them at the dorms at UM, but, uh, but I remember that, that, I do remember vaguely that role that you were talking about, but then he was head of men's tennis at the USTA for a while. So. Oh, right, I remember that. So, and then, and then I guess he went to, to Atlanta, to, to Georgia Tech, and he's been there. Years go by fast. Now. I think he's been there. Yeah, over a decade. Really. But I think from a, there's teaching and there's coaching. It's. Um, you know, we define teaching as information transfer and coaching as a human relationship. And you, you use the term tennis minds or tennis mind. I, you know, obviously I understand that to a certain degree. It comes down to telling our students, they say, I told people, well, I spent a lot of time trying to develop a tennis mind and why you're here is I'm going to try to share thoughts with you. But they're not necessarily my thoughts. It's just the body of work, the, what, what we've gathered but we always come back to, well, the nuts and bolts and then the X's and O's. Uh, are, are people really studying the content? We have a couple of boys here uh, that were here before. They were here spring break and now they're back, regular schoolers. And I'll just I'll say, okay, you two guys, you know, go out on the court and show me where GVP is. And now I don't know. And go, the two of you go stand in the percentage posts. You know, nice kids, they look, they're around, I don't know. I say, well, you haven't studied the content. I can go back and with seven concepts, uh, Red, Yellow, Green comes from Clarence Mabry's book, the John Newcomb Family Tennis Book. But I, I think it's very important to reference things. But uh, no, you, you, you. But you, you made the comment here before, I believe, you know, the difference between a teacher and a coach. First time I ever heard somebody mention that to me was uh, Francisco Montana. He's, you know, I must have been, so after my accident, I kind of went through a phase when I was about. 26, 27, where I was playing all the open tournaments. And I remember taking lessons with him. And, you know, we'd hit for about 15 minutes and we'd sit out and talk for about an hour and a half. I think even back then I had more of a idea of coaching versus playing. You know, it was just f fun to listen to his recollection of, of how he built not only Francisco, but Pablo, who was an All-American at Tennessee and he was coaching that with Delaware and you know it was just very interesting how he would analyze things from how he always felt he was learning from the teaching perspective but he always felt he was very good at the coaching aspect so that was probably the, um, the first time I'd ever heard that that connection of teacher versus coach and how few people can actually do both 
Jeff McDonald, former Vanderbilt coach, recruiting one of our players who played for him. And he was, you know, flattering. He was I'm in the room, it was my classroom, and he said, well, if you've been training here for six years, you know, he, he said, you know more about the nuts and bolts, the X's and O's than I do. And I don't think that was necessarily true. He's talking to, a, you know, he coached the women's team, 17, 18-year-old girl. And then, but then he said, I got a question for you. I think he's one of the coaches who would have his players read the book, Art of War. He said, well, during the Korean War, the U.S. Marines, people are shooting at him from a foxhole. And he was nice enough to define, okay, they dug a hole, they're shooting from ground level, so you can't see him. And he said, what's your strategy? You know, he just basically thought the girl should be more patient with the baseline. And, you know, she just kind of looked at her with her blue eyes and had no idea. And uh, the answer was, you just wait. And, you know, you starve them out. You know, they're, they're going to have to come out for water. They're going to have to come out for food. And we're just going to wait. You know, so, you know, it's just, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, common sense is not common. You know, that's a pretty tough question to ask a teenage girl, a teenage boy. Um, but to get people to just stop and think. I like definitions of coaching. I think the one where the, the player without the coach won't bring the story out of themselves. Stories there, but they need the coach to help them bring the story out. Yeah. And a lot of times that's more about character. It's more about the intangibles. I think it's pretty easy to teach people how to hit a basic forehand. The problem, the challenge is, is unteaching them, and then everything is surrounding. The parents come in and all the questions. You know, those videos we make, I know you've seen umpteen of them. We've, we've made so many of them for your players, and there's so much verbiage, but it's really a tool of persuasion. I mean, I usually when whenever I bring the kids up here, I come with them because you know I know that for most of them, it's a lot of information that you know you almost need someone to help decipher it a little bit before it just overwhelms them. So, no uh, disco tennis. I remember disco dancing, disco tennis, disco here and disco there. That's it. You know, no, just cut out art. You know, you know people will criticize us and say it's cookie cutter. I mean, a ready position is a ready position. You know, you're going to reinvent the ready position. You're going to complicate the ready position. So the ready position, it's like someone coming out of the blocks or a football player getting down a three-point stance. You go to any Little League baseball game, Little League basketball game, they're all basically shooting or batting the same exact way. You know, if you're going to watch a Little League football game, they're all going to be throwing pretty much the same way. You're not going to be seeing very many Bernie Kosars out there in the Little League football or or Tim Tebow's out there. And, you know, so, yeah, it's crazy that, uh, you know, that uh, an elegant game is frowned upon where you're basically trying to, to pass, like, a professional player that's hitting a shot that's maybe out of circumstance, forced out of making adjustments on the fly comparing it with a child who's hitting a ball that's coming at 30 miles an hour at a basic speed, right? There's no comparison to the... Well, we always say efficient strokes are aesthetically appealing, and they, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Least amount of movement, least amount of moving parts, least amount of muscle recruitment. I don't really like the word classic. It's a classical forehand. It's stereotypical. I love showing the kids like a video of Stefan Edberg, and I tell them, Please find anything to complain about on anything backhand related from him. Backhand volley, backhand overhead, backhand ground stroke, backhand underspin. I mean, he's as elegant as they come when it comes to an all-court game. Christopher Swantonson, I mispronounced the town from Vec Show, was there a few times. He played at Stetson. He spent years and years with us. So he has a college video made, and I'm looking at it. They, they sent it to me to... Look at it, see if it was appropriate. I look at it, look at it again. I go, and I remember asking, "Is that Stefan Edberg hitting balls with you?" And, and it was. Um, Edberg was coaching. I think people should listen to Fetter. I mean, if you're not going to listen to Fetter, who are you going to listen to? So, Edberg was coaching him at one point. See, and see people say, "Why are you coming to the net more? Why don't you come to the net as much as Edberg?" And he said, "If I could volley like him, I would." Hank Jungle, coach Tom Gullickson, excuse me, Tim, um, from the 
from Xenia, Ohio, the Kettering Racket Club, talked him into trying pro tennis. He called it the supermarket of tennis. So, okay, if we're going to go buy, you know, the right, the right foods, the right, the right, pick out the right fruit, right vegetables, and say, okay, we're going to copy Edberg's backhand volley. You know, before we went on air, we were talking about uh, Max Cressy. I really think that um, I would get laughed at and say, go sit in section F. But Nick Curios should look at what Cressy's doing. He's trying to hit a volley. He's trying to play three-shot combination. And Curios, I mean, I think that's a fact checker. I don't know if he hit more than four overheads in four sets. Not very much. He didn't come in, but he, you know, he, he doesn't have the, the skill set. Basically, the way he hangs on the racket, the way he positions his racket, his elbow, and he's finessing volleys. As great as he is, he's a great athlete. He's, he's going for shots. You know, it's hit or miss. He's dictating. With a serve like that, you're going to be playing a lot of tiebreakers. You're going to be in a lot of sets. But um, I mean, everyone made a big deal about, you know, his, his antics, his screaming. But in my opinion, what cost him at least the third set was the 4-all 40 love game. He, he stoned a volley, and he, and, he, and he missed another one. So, it, you know, if, if he makes either one of those, you're in another tie break. You know, and who knows? You maybe you're in a fifth set. Maybe he wins in four. Who knows? But uh, you know, all that people remember is all the screaming at his box, and kind of you know ignore the fact that that, for the most part, is strategic. You know, he's trying to get under someone's head. You know, he's you know, no one. It was hilarious listening to Patrick McEnroe and John McEnroe. You know, John McEnroe used to go on tirades arguing with an official. Right? What's the difference? You're arguing for three minutes. You're affecting the the rhythm of play. So, you know, Kyrgios going out there and just barking at his box, you know, it's not easy for a guy like Novak to carry on playing that situation, and he handled it perfectly. Along with, with Matt Clore, who was on last week, we both spent some time coaching Australian Nick Horton. Small guy, good player. Uh, really good coming into college tennis. Anyway... He had a win over Nick in the 12s, and I'm asking about Kyrgios. You can kind of guess that, you know, Kyrgios actually, if you just read and listen, um, you know, he said, no, nah, I'd be terrible for a coach. I don't like to take advice. But you can almost guess that, okay, here's a guy. Um, he's going for big serves at a, as a young age. And, and, and Nick Horton said he always had a big ego. He's always going for big shots. And, I mean, he's... I mean, I don't think he's that confident in that cross-court forehand, but he's just taking a rip. The backhand is a, I mean, is a reset. He's really kind of bunning the backhand. You know, they feel, oh, he's got a great backhand. I mean, he, people aren't really pressuring, pressuring his backhand. You know, that a, a stroke, you don't know if a stroke is really weak until it's pressured. I did read, which I was really shocked by, that three people asked about coaching curios. It was McEnroe, which I, okay, I could see that. Connors, I can see that. But Sampras. I heard you say this, and I was shocked also. I mean, is, you know, I need to fact check that. So. Is, is, that's on a Wikipedia page. With Sampras. Oh, they must be right, right? Yeah, correct. It was Sampras, you know, just think about how clean his volley was. And, you know, um, he was not, you know, that open racket face and, and, and swinging downward. He's swinging through the volley. I mean. It'd be interesting to see if he. If he'd be able to translate what he does to somebody else, that'd be kind of a million dollar, you know. You know, awareness, acceptance, commitment. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this. But if he understood this, the, the geometry of the court, understood the stats, and with that serve, he's, at, he's very athletic, if he just opened himself to learning. You know, you mentioned that uh, trailer, I'm calling it a trailer, with, with uh, Jack Kramer. Jack Kramer would say, hey, take a year off. You know, he said that about Sabatini. Is, you know, learn right. to volley. I mean, obviously he can hit an overhead, but anybody's, you know, you know, the serve and overhead are so similar. That the, um, yeah, the curios. Um, he's fun to, you know, he is putting people in the seats. And, you know, I was watching, uh, there was a video that I saw that came across where Leighton Hewitt's son was out there practice, practicing on the grass and, he looks like a mini curious. He plays really backhand. Looks very similar. It looks. Uh, so I'm sure he's. You know he's 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 great for tennis. I don't really care what anybody says. Like the guy is, 
is going to bring in people that, you know, while I was watching the final, you know, I was getting text messages from friends of mine that never watched tennis. So, you know, this guy's going to bring in. Yeah, it's kind of like the McEnroe Connor show. Bring, he's going to bring fans in from from somewhere. And basically, yeah, the, the Federer and Nadal fans might not, they might not be their cup of tea, but you know, I think the guys could be great for tennis if you were to. Yeah, I know he's had a feud with uh, Leighton Hewitt. It was great to watch the tribute from the Hall of Fame with Leighton Hewitt. And I, I love Hewitt. You know, what a great fighter. I mean, you know, we did have a coach uh, say well, that one time. He's had bigger feuds with other Australians. I think Hewitt was the one he said that was decent with him. I mean, he's gone back like, and like forth Bern- with Pat Cash. Bernard Tomic and Well, Pat Cash, he was, was very critical of him. And, uh, you know, so there were yeah. you know, quite a few others that were. But with, you know, he has a, a reset on the backhand side. And so is his younger son. But so is his Alex... Demonor? Demonor, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, you know, hey, sometimes you just got to go play. But but that's where it's a brain drain all the way up to the top. It doesn't, I tell the parents all the time. Because, you know, the credibility factor in tennis, well, I'm going to take lessons from so-and-so because they were such and such a great player. And that's a bonus. Welby Van Orn, that's a, he was a top 10 player in the world. It's only a bonus if someone can play. You know, granted, you know, if, you can take a lesson from how to fly an airplane. You want to take a lesson on how to fly an airplane. So that's what Braden used to say. If you expect your students to play, you should expect yourself to play. You should have gone through, you know, it doesn't matter if it was at the amateur level that you know what it's like to compete and choke and get nervous. And then you can relate to your player, but all the way up, whether you're on the tour, you're around uh, the different levels on the tour, college tennis, the different levels in college tennis, juniors, doesn't matter whether it's grassroots or national. There's a lack of information. You know, Roberto Calla, um, South American, who's been with us for a long time, worked with us for 15 straight years. He says it so well. He watches someone play, and he'll just say, no information. But that doesn't mean that that kid doesn't have true grit, fight. You know, they right. you got that warrior mentality. Um, confident, Jim Lair, confident fighter image. So we, we teach a lot of people end up having – aesthetically appealing strokes but that doesn't mean they can beat mickey mouse yeah i mean speaking of south america i mean it's uh it's interesting when i've heard you say that vic spent time down there with Vilas's coach i always wondered from there did that expand to other parts i mean it, you know i know the hotbed of tennis in argentina is in Tandil, but uh be kind of curious to see if uh you know if that you know, because I mean, what the top coaches that I've heard in the past were like the Perez Rodan, the, the developmental coaches down there. So I mean, it'd be kind of interesting to see if, you know, if they had a, a braided influence or if they were just basically um, kind of going on their own, on their own methods, as they learned. Yeah, Vilas. You know, he ended up playing um, after that. He played doubles with uh, Tracy's brother Jeff, who played at UCLA with Connors. Um, v, at that time, I remember Vic talking about that experience. He wanted the players to play catch because he was helping with their serves, and he looked over and they're kicking a ball, kicking a ball up in the air. But he, he Vic developed a device where you, he coming back to Agassi, counteracting speed against speed, where the ball machine, his dad, souped up to go so fast that it was like huge popsicle sticks. This gadget that Vic had designed, and the legs snap up. You know, the energy, we see a lot of times people lift after they hit. And that's of no value. The energy doesn't transfer into the shot. But I talked to a young coach who's here in the States. He's from Greece, and he's four years older than Tissipas. And, for example, he grew up uh, with Tissipas, and he told me that the coach that they first had worked with Vic. I mean, you know, through Vic's book. It's right. like with, uh, so did, uh, you know, it's written in a biography on Djokovic, that is childhood coach. Uh, bought Braden books. So, um, yeah, I do think that Vic really had a major impact on the game, but at the same time, I think it's faded. And I also think, too, that, you know, I, know, I just know when he passed, people were so nice, but, you know, you know, I could tell in a, not a New York minute, but a New York second, it was, oh, yeah, I really did. You know, I, I knew everything about the Vic Braden method. And, and uh, you know, certainly, um, I think 
you know, people really remember Vic for his personality, his presentation. I mean, he was such a great entertainer, but I do think that he was so misinterpreted because he, over time, he had just gathered so much information. I mean, the, well, number one, I think it's great what Andy, you know, did over COVID where basically he was able to take a lot of the information that you had stored up and then put it on Instagram and basically, you know, it's unfortunate the, you know, the plagiarism that's out there that everybody seems to take some of the information that you guys have posted and then rebrand it. But the first time that I remember Vic from my own life was in 1989. He was in the uh, tennis magazine talking about the serve. And I remember, I mean, as if it were yesterday, reading that, that magazine and all the elements of it made sense, but it was so, it was so foreign. It was that nobody was really talking about the serve in anywhere, you know, and it's crazy because all, all that I had heard at that point, I was probably 13 years old at that point. All I heard was scratch the back and, you know, some of the basic things. So, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have paid attention more to that magazine article because I might have had a better serve and less shoulder issues, but, uh, you know, such yeah, is life. Years ago, the forehand was, you know, shake, shake hands on the backside, shake hands on the front side, point the racket at the back fence, point the racket at the front fence. It's a 180-degree swing on a 20-degree court. But I remember when this book, Tennis for Future, came out in 77, it was looked upon as being radical to, you know, you close the racket face. You know, obviously, if a kid has a semi-Western grip, the racket face is closed. But say someone has an Eastern grip, they got to push it down like they're dribbling a basketball. But one, one thing with Andy, you know, he's, he loves Vic Brady and very close to Vic. Other than Melody, his widow, the last 10 years of Vic's life, no one spent more time with Vic than Andy. But with that, Andy, unlike myself, I mean, I take pride and I put things up on Facebook on a daily basis, but I don't know how to post. I frustrate a few people over the years. You and I both. But with that, you know, Andy was addressing every question. And, and uh, he's a very positive guy, but how many times can you tell someone you know, in the forehand, no, you don't turn the doorknob, you don't have the windshield wiper, and, you know, no, the recovery is not the follow through. And it's just crazy, crazy, crazy with what's going on. I mean, we get tired of serve plus one. You, know, you see these kids arching the back, tossing over their head. They think they're hitting a serve because of the, the trajectory makes the ball bounce, you know, and, and then they're just looking to load up on a forehand. I mean, I understand it also from the from the other side in the sense that, you know, you're fighting against what you, what you know or you think you know. And, you know, the information that, that is presented could make a lot of sense to somebody, but in the back of their mind, they're fighting what they feel, what they feel they do when they hit a shot or what they see with their eyes. So the fact that they don't understand it, I mean, you know, I've spoken to a lot of guys that were former players and, you know, I mean, you've mentioned it before with uh, Bob Lutz on the slice backhand and then basically, you know, th that happens with everybody basically, and, you know, and I remember you guys saying recently that you only consider your forehand good because you're comparing it to your backhand. So it, I know from my, from my end, you know, I had, like I said to you earlier, I had a lot of positive tennis minds in my early coaching life. And when I met you and I started really following the content, I mean, it all made sense. It was all logical. I mean, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Mr. Jones, my uh, 11th grade uh, AP physics professor. I wish I would have paid more attention, but uh, but it all made sense. And But at the same token, I was trying to combine what made sense with what I knew from the past, and you know, it doesn't work. I mean, you really have to take the, the realization that physics is unbeaten, basically. So basically, you have to follow that logic. It's spelled out to you, and then basically, you know, I, I think one good way for most people to try to do it is Try to learn with the opposite hand. I would uh, definitely say, like, you know, if, if you're convinced that you're doing your way, go learn with your opposite hand. You know, the principles you set out from Vic, from all the teaching professors you put over the years, and you'll be amazed how how quickly you'll pick things up. It won't, you know, if you're if you're a complete klutz with your opposite hand, 
you'll be amazed how quickly you actually uh, are able to pick up certain shots. So, well, you've taught tennis how many years now? Long time. Long time. I mean, it's uh, 20, 25 plus years. I would say twenty five years. So, it, you know, the human being in inexact science. You know, you you can't you know can't approach every lesson the same to make an understatement. You just can't approach every lesson the same. So, but it, it was definitely a. I would definitely say it was a part A and a part B to my coaching life. And it's not that part A was worthless. You know, you learn how to deal with people. You learn how to communicate. You learn how to present information in different ways that, you know, that are that are easily understandable for the introvert, for the extrovert, for the for the feeler, for the you know, for the th you know, it's it's important. So that it definitely taught me how to deal with personalities. But the information once I actually learned it, it was. You know, it's it made a big difference. I mean, and it's obvious to me in the sense that the myelin that I've built up on my serve, there is no amount of hours that I can put in to address that. But, you know, if I can help a, a kid now not go through the same issues that I went through as far as injuries and, you know, it's it makes me feel good because pretty soon I'm going to start serving with my left hand because I, I think I do that better than my right. And what were your issues on your serve? So Toss basically... And I mean, it was everything. So basically, you know, I, throughout college, you know, I was I was riding on this on, on my kick serve. So basically, you know, I had a lot of Spanish guys on my college team. You know, those basic patterns that you see today, you know, you see back then. I mean, you know, we had a number one guy on our team, Gus Lopez from Spain, who just had, you know, a massive kick serve. I mean, he would literally stand a couple feet outside the um, singles line, and he would kick it into the side fence every single time but the guy was built like a bull i mean it's uh you know my shoulder ligaments are not the same as his but uh you know but again it was a great serve for me but over time you know my arm really started to, to fall apart you know and I'm, you know when i see guys like edberg when i see guys like rafter um you know it's amazing that they even kept it together as long as they did because, you know, you're talking about guys that are playing best of five sets, you know. Uh, yeah, it's like Tommy Oz had the same, I believe, uh, fact checker. He had the same yep. shoulder operation yeah. in the same year or twice. But, yeah, you you don't want to be tossing that ball way over your head. And, again, like you just, uh, you just fall in love with the result. You know, I'm going to steal your line uh, about uh, crummy – Beats, uh, crummy doesn't know it's crummy until it's too late almost in the sense that, you know, my kick serve would work phenomenally against most good guys. But when I came across the elite guys, they just step in, take it early, and uh, completely neutralize my kick serve. So, yeah, we had two girls practicing with the day. They both have scholarships in the SEC and athletic and competitive. Enjoy the sport. Fun to be around. But looking at just about every shot they hit, the ceiling but you know they have to just be it's kind of like one in a billion one in a million if they're gonna you know use college as a stepping stone to the pros one thing for us you know say a 15 year old is sent here sometimes a coach comes with them i mean i think very good actually on the first visit when the parents come but the kid is coming in they're 15 they know what they know what they're coming into, and they're told, you need to do this and take six months off. You need to come in, and this is what you're going to do. Because the game you have, again, there's a ceiling. You're going to get stuck. Uh, it could be a, a boy or girl. You're okay, you're a 10 on the UTR, and it's, it's not going to be easy to be an 11 because you don't have options. You know, you can't do this on the return. You can't do this and the, when the ball's up in the air. Um, so... I know that you know a, a typical situation when you, someone says, "Okay, you want a tennis lesson?" For us, we don't. We make it a prerequisite. We don't really give a lesson unless we film them first. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I tease people and say, "What do you do for a living?" I go, "I fight ignorance every day." And it's like, like you know, it's like. Um, I mean, the one aspect that I would think of with with coaching, you know, every situation is different. I remember. I think when you were down in Miami, I started working with that girl, Samantha, and then basically, you know, I, she might have been 16 or 17 at the time, 
And, you know, she was six months away from probably getting her offers when it came to college. And, you know, in reality, that wasn't the time to go out there and make changes in her game. I basically saw what she had, you know, try to address certain patterns, try to get her to understand, you know, who's doing what to whom and and go from there. And then, you know, she's got a scholarship to Pac-12 school, you know, she's doing great. And then was the time that I want, you know, when once she signed in the beginning of her senior year, that would have been the time to really make the revamp. No, and, true. That's a very good point. You sign. But it's you know, it's it's a tough it's a that's a tough sell. I mean, that's a once once they get to that level they think they're, you know, you know, the little higher spot is just right around the corner. They don't realize that, you know, moving up five or ten spots is way harder than moving up uh you know, two hundred spots that you moved up earlier. Uh Take Marita played at Rice. He spent almost a year and a half with us just studying English before he went to Rice and he's sent players to us. Um, Shorio Fukeda, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I was traveling, so I, she came and worked with me, and then I took her to Dave Anderson's place. And she was there for almost the same amount of time studying English, a year and a half. And um, I remember talking to the people at Ohio State, so they, they took a risk, they took her. She, had, she was good enough to play, uh, I think the last tournament she played before she started with us was the Australian Open, the juniors. And she just knew that, you know, her forehand as a whole and it was just a weakness and but you know so I, I remember telling people at Ohio State she hasn't played competitive tennis in a long time but she went she was an all-american she was top 10 in the country played one but I, I do think that you know like being with Steve Denton we spent a lot of time just chatting at the national clay courts he's looking at people like well could I get that kid to play doubles the juniors are very nervous, and he's looking to see, you know, if that kid win. Now, that's obviously part of it, but um, there's so many players that, um, you know, perhaps they could overcome that, like I said earlier, that they just have that an amazing level of, com of, competitive, of competitiveness. You know, there's always a Santoro or, um, like, even look at, like, a Monica Selish. Right. Yeah, she took the ball so early, and... Um, took the ball on the rise. Braden used to say that he had never filmed anyone that took the ball earlier. People didn't have the skill set. You know, they could get her to look pretty bad if they could dink it around and take the role of the spoiler just from the service line in. But she was always just in total control of the point because, and she didn't have the best serve. Right. But she, she's one like, okay, this kid. You know, I think it, I'm the biggest critic of what we've put together, the Great Base Tennis Pathway we're not going to develop an unorthodox player. And you know, I do think that, you know, someone get, you could have that, the, the philosophy, okay, once they're 15, you know, okay, maybe it's 14, but once they're 14, we're going to just let them go. We're going to band-aid it. We're going to work within their game. Um, I mean, you, know, you know, and I do think a club, a club coach or you know, someone who's just, Unlike myself, if someone's not getting off an airplane and, they're, okay, they're coming to see you for several months and they've been told to take time off, it's almost like you have to teach one stroke at a time. If you win them over and now, now they're confident they couldn't hit a backhand volley, now they can, then you can say, okay, now let me talk to you about you. Uh, yeah. you and and most, most young kids, they think their forehand is everything and they think their forehand is a, a weapon and it's not. It's just a it's just a weapon for them at this time. They're going to find out down the road what they thought was a weapon, what they thought was an asset. It's going to you're going to find out it's a liability. That's yeah. true. Very true. I feel like I, I I went through that myself. The you know the, we talk about brain typing with the parents. You know one can cancel the other one out. They both have to be on the same page. We we talked about parenting. I always tell parents it's okay to disagree over something your child is going through, but don't disagree in front of yeah. them. Because once that happens, you know the kids they just learn to be the master manipulator. I mean, that's really the one aspect. Uh, that was probably my favorite uh, podcast. I shouldn't say my favorite, but one of my favorites was the brain types. I found that to be 
incredibly interesting. I started doing it with all the kids at tennis, and I started trying to, you know, break them down, look at, look over it historically. Never could find the uh, the tennis magazine article you referenced, but uh, oh, we have it right here on the shelf. With we have the uh, the survey. Uh, John Niedagel made it all the way to the cover of Tennis Magazine. You know, Vic, intellectual curiosity. You know, it'd be very difficult for any of us uh, in our circle to criticize Vic Braden, but he did get so enthusiastic about one thing and then the next, and um, but he was always very, very, very much in tune with, you know, what John Niedag was doing. You know, I remember being flattered by Vic St. Steve. We should have been coaching ESTPs and ISTPs. Um, you know, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, uh, like the INFJ. Not too many great players are INFJs, but then you have to work it out. Introverts, even though they can focus, they can't handle as much stress. The ends get way ahead of themselves. They're not in the moment. You know, everyone has to be trained to be a thinker. And then Js, you know, they want everything to be just so. Then you add that all up. Um, but no, it's a, it is a simple system. Um, I believe it's Jeremy, Jeremy Nidago. You know, Andy, Andy knows him, the son, the father. He's trying to carry the torch and um, make it more scientifically val or make it scientifically validated. But I mean, I've took, over the years teaching kids, taught so many kids where their dad or their mom was a psychiatrist, psychologist, and almost all of them say it was one of the best things they right they right. learned in school. Yeah. I mean, I, I I was I was really really. I mean, that's that's the one that I've replayed the most times. I mean, because it's. So much information there that you're, it's, it's not easy to really get the yeah. true gist of it. I mean, and then when I came to visit you a couple of times, you know, you were more on the personality side, and I saw Andy. Yeah, for sure. Just saw a guy that just hit a ball, and he was able to. Uh, yeah, Andy's going to go gross motor skills, fine motor skills. And that was impressive. I mean, when I saw him analyze based on how a guy was hitting the ball, I was like, wow, that, that's. You didn't even speak to the kid, and he was already. Uh... Yeah, Vic Braden used to talk about. I think it was the Franklin Day Planner, and it, the meeting took place um, at Cota de Casa. And so the CEO comes in, and he's got like a team of eight people, eight executives, and you know they're interested because you know the corporations want to know who they're going to hire. Just you know, Nidago was famous where he started working with, uh, you know, the NBA and the NFL and. So the CEO um, questioned John Niedagel. He goes, well, how, how accurate is this? And Niedagel said, can I just have a minute of your time? And so it was Niedagel, and Vic was just flying on the wall, sitting and watching all this. And he went through everybody's brain type, just based on how they walked in the room and said good morning. And then it, he said, okay, got it nailed. Yeah, I mean, it'd be fascinating to know you had insight to let's say professional sports teams to know who is actually using it and who isn't you know so when you look at some of the historic uh players that haven't made it you know i can't remember off the top of my head but you guys were always referencing the the quarterbacks the stps yeah so basically you know all the ones that uh, have been major flops and tens and hundreds of millions have been wasted on the quarterback when you sign them as a 22 year old you know how many were were using the brain types? So it'd be, I, I'd be love to know that. I doubt we'd ever find out. But uh. yeah, I was wish wish Ryan Leaf all the best. But it was Ryan, Ryan was famous Ryan Leaf and I mean there's other Peyton Pey, Manning. You had like Jamarcus Russell and you had uh, like the Tim Couches. You know you had guys that were drafted number one overall that were basically you know uh, busts. You know or, or you can even look at uh, David Carr and De Derek Carr. So Derek. The third round pick. He's had a long professional career. His brother was the first overall pick. You know, yeah. Granted, there might be other extenuating circumstances that prevented him from having great careers. But you know, as an outsider, I'm always really curious now: is there someone in those offices that are really, with the amount of money being invested into these teams, is there someone out there analyzing the brain types, personality types? It'd be fascinating to know. No, I remember telling my brother, who was a GM, and he, that expression, he didn't buy in. 
that, hey, you should talk to this guy, John Neenoggle, about who to draft. Oh, he didn't buy in. You know, it's also, too, is that how are they going to gel with their teammates? Right. You know, it's kind of like doubles partners. So, no, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's an amazing training tool. With, you know, Y and ISTP, so many great tennis players are ISTPs. The I can focus. They get their energy from within. Yes, you know, the, of the, the different preferences, they're in the moment, like a Michael Jordan, you know, ISTP. Uh, today, one of the kids was asking about John McEnroe, ISTP. Braden had a chance to meet with uh, McEnroe's mother, says the introvert or extrovert. And she said he's a flaming introvert, but he's in, in front of a crowd with a microphone. He, you know, he's learned to, uh, to deal with that. And when you hear McEnroe and Edward are the same uh, personality yeah. types. It's, uh... But anyway, um, no, it's, it's something to review. I think the, the tennis math, I do. I mean, I have had people tell me that they like the interviews, but initially when we said, okay, let's talk about the forehand, let's talk about the backhand. We've had people tell us that, um, you know, that they would like to see a, a video with a, with a dialogue. But we, we do have all sorts of videos to look at. We have... A lot of short clips on Instagram, uh, but so people, you know, for the most part, um, I mean, going people back, told us they like the length. Sorry, to interrupt. They like the length of the podcast. Yeah, I'm one of them. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a staple to my Wednesday morning. So as I usually uh, wake up, go I, I, I recently had a mom tell me that she didn't like to listen to ten minutes of time. Well, that's a, that's a problem if you have to sit and listen to the whole thing, unless you're going on a road trip once a week, international yeah, I mean, flight. Uh, I plug in the AirPods and uh, off I go. So I usually wake up pretty early. So I get I, I get to go through at least half of it. Could help with fitness if you got on a treadmill. That would help. It'd be, yeah. It could be a start. But going back to the uh, personality types, I mean, it was it's always something that as I listened to it, I just kept thinking back to back when the USTA was doing a lot of the junior camps and bringing kids in. I mean, it seems like it would have been a no-brainer to go out there and really understand that and understand which coaches to pair up with certain kids and or which groups to form. You know, that that was one of another good episode was when you were interviewing um is it uh Richard Hernandez and yeah. Myron Mann and they talk about the teams that they have in in Canada and the basically the um what was it that they had the, the part that I thought was was amazing actually was that the nationals were on different weeks. You know, I, I'm used to here being in here in Florida or in the United States where last week was clay courts. So, I mean, if you have two kids that are, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. If you're yeah. in different divisions, you're, you're in different states. And uh, so if in Canada they're doing it a different way, obviously maybe the draws are smaller also, not 256 draws, but, uh, you know, it seems like a much more streamlined approach to running tournaments and identifying who the best players are or the best prospects and then and going from there. But, you know, and then they were talking about the camps that they were obligated to have where they were, I forgot what the, what they called it, but they were basically, you know, the coaches were very prepared. The players were being tested. It was way, it just felt way more thorough than anything I had seen from the USTA and, uh, in a long time. Yeah, it's actually Miron Man. Myron Grunberg's part of that circle. He was the general manager of that club that Richard and Miron have spent so many years at. I talked to Miron on a regular basis. I talked to him the other day about several players, but you know, that's one thing that the listeners, you know, I've known Miron, I think, since he was 10 or 11. So now, you know, so I'm going to guess he's 43, 44. And, you know, he, he just... He's not being critical, but when he just goes, okay, on the serve, on the forehand, on the backhand, you know, on the volleys, you know, just this is what the player needs to work on. Now, I think a lot of times what happens is people let go and say, okay, they're just good to go. They got to a certain level, and then they don't work on technique. With, to us, you never stop working on technique. You know, in a pie graph, maybe it's, you know, 5% at the beginning practice, 5% at the end. Is it just the way the brain works? It's like, no, we have to go through the, the term cleansing your strokes. After a match, okay, I'm going to go hit, especially young kids, because what happens with young kids, you're trying to teach them to play with close to a forehand grip as possible. 
And when the, you know, because the balls are up high at the end of the, say, five days of match play, three days of match play, the grip is starting to go under. It's like, no, we got to go back. Um, you know, it's, I, you know, I think that goes away. I mean, we I tell kids, oh, if you're going off to college, take a cone with you, take a sock with you, get a ball hopper, find where there's a backboard, make sure that you know where there's a mirror, and you don't, out, yeah, you never a, outgrow that. But, but, but people just say they just stop working on basics. I mean, I, I just think that that has to be, you know, be interested to know like the routines that were done. Let's say like at an Illinois or an NC State. I know where you had influence with with the coaches. Because unless that directive is coming from the head coach or the or the assistant, I just don't see how a bunch of 18, 18 20 year olds are going to go out there and be that disciplined. You know, yeah, obviously you're going to get some that might have real dreams about being players in the future and they're and they're disciplined and they can do it. But for the most part, you know, if it's going to be, you know, I mean, that Illinois team was phenomenal. I mean, they were undefeated and they. Yeah, people say maybe one of the best college teams of all time, but then you have to think, well, you know, where they go is with with pro tennis, and certainly, it's amazing the success that you know players have had that perhaps weren't so successful in college tennis. But yet, I mean, wasn't that entire team like a one-handed backhands? Like uh, five of the six, and when they beat Vanderbilt in the finals, rather Hart was seven. He played, he won thirty matches, but he wasn't. He wasn't playing in the final. Craig Tiley, um, he was with us for seven years. I tell so many stories about Tiley, but one, uh, David Weist was with us for a long time. And David Weist went to Monroe, Michigan. He worked at Vic Braden's hometown. He was teaching tennis at the indoor courts at the YMCA. And Paul Showers, who's from Monroe, Michigan, Dr. Paul Showers. So he he played at Kalamazoo. He rebuilds his game in, in uh just he just told me well David Weiss told me when Tylee started at Illinois he said they're going to be awesome he goes they'll win a national championship if he stays there long enough you know he's a classmate and showers are going why are you saying that and he goes because he's going to teach the players to do what I'm teaching you to do and, I mean, and, and it was I mean I remember when when they won they all were going forward that was uh that was unhurt me because probably I mean in the Big Ten, I mean, they were probably way behind uh, the Ohio States, the Michigans, the Northwesterns from when I was in college. So I can't imagine. And then overnight, they just became the best team. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, they yeah. were all coming forward. But, again, like. And the, fa the fact checker, I think it was Chris Martin, his brother Dave. Went to Stanford. His name right? came up because he was, when we interviewed Jeremy Wurtzman because he played with Lipsky who went to Stanford. Right. As Chris Martin won some really key points at the end of that match. It was it was the last match out. But what we have on film in our library is I went to um, Japan to teach tennis teachers. And why I've had so many experiences like that is they hired one of my former students, H Hubert Crash. And you know that's where you know Steve Smith. It's a pretty common name. Like who is that guy? So um, I remember recommending Tylee to go because he started working with the Davis Cup team, so he had good ink, you know, the credibility side. And at that time, um, that Fab Five, the great recruiting class he had, they came in. But I have this all in film. So he went to Japan, and he had all the film of the guys drop hitting balls, being in the alley, you know, tossing balls to each other, shadow swinging in front of a mirror. Um, you know, that's one way to do it. I mean, that's the way I would recommend, you know, we'll come back to the USTA with, you know, you mentioned junior camps, I want to touch upon that. But I, I've said for years, you know, you take, take what Tylee did, and we trained him to do what he did. And then we've been around indirectly uh, Ty Tucker. Tucker. You take those two programs, okay, let's make that American tennis. Because Tucker, those guys work so hard. They hit so many balls. And like Jeremy said on a podcast, I said, why is Tucker so good? He said, he makes every practice seem like it's round of 16 in the NCAA tournament. But the USTA, um, you know, again, a lot of great people, a lot of great causes. I don't think they should even have those camps. I, I think the money should go into education. I mean, the, you know, do, well, we're going to handpick these people to fly into Orlando. It's going to cost so much money. And I just think it's money misspent, you know, and I do think, you know, people in tennis know, like, okay, uh, 
It was in 87 when they started the player development program. Before that, the United States Tennis Association, they just provided the service with leagues and tournaments. You know, they, they had uh, certainly a department for, you know, education research. If you wanted to order movies and educational tennis movies, you know, they, they had all sorts of workshops. But I just don't get it. You know, they'll say, we're going to bring these kids in. You know, granted, they could come in and do camps where they compete with one another. But, you know, then it's, it's not really a tournament. You know, and, and I think people forgot, you know, Wayne Bryan. Right. In this letter to the USTA, and, and um, yeah, so anyway, when you said that, um, it, it is a very good, you know, that the Canadian system allows a kid if they they do well in the twelves that the next week they can play the fourteens. Um, but yeah, the, I just don't understand the money spent in having all those kids come into camps, and, you know, separate the kid from the private coach, and um, you know then. Is there a plan? Is there a developmental plan? I mean, it almost seems like the uh, the old uh, Boletari model, where they, you're coming in with your coach, and you were training at the uh, the toughest playground in tennis. You know that that seems like a way better model. Well, did they come in with their coach? I mean, I would for a lot of people that I mean, at least that I remember from junior, like they would basically there'd be a lot of people that would come in there with their private coach. And use the facilities and training. Yeah, I, I know so, some of that took place, but but yeah, I mean maybe not in large numbers, but I mean that model seems way better than just going out there meeting someone for the first time, and then you know forcing you know a square peg into a circular hole there. So basically, well, I appreciate your input on the podcast. One thing that you've emphasized, which our listeners should know, is that that we should keep reinforcing what the eight pillars bring and the history behind the eight pillars. And, you know, just to speculate, in all fairness to Nick, he should be in the Hall of Fame. He create, created an amazing playground. I say he's in the Hall of Fame because of environment. Where Vandermeer and Braden are in the International Tennis Hall of Fame because of education. But they just I speculate, you know, can you imagine if you could turn the clock back and all the players that went through ball Terry's that they had a Welby Van Horn influence? Right, like you know, you no, especially that. they come in, hey, they're under 12. We're going to slow it down and we're going to teach people. Then we're going to pride, you know, you say doubles and it's like these kids can play doubles. That's kind of how you speculated that, uh, you know, Vic was at, was at the Beverly Hills Club, True Club and then he was followed by Lansdorp. Well, no, so, it was a Jack Kramer Club. Jack Kramer Club, so. Yeah, it was, you know, I did a workshop in California and Elliot Telsher came to it. He wasn't there for the whole, you know, what is it, 18 hours, but he was there for half of it. And I said, I wasn't there, but I'll tell you, this is how it worked. Tell me when I'm wrong. And so many things happened for what the players that came out of that Kramer club. But, if you know, Vic was there first, and it was great because he taught a great base. He taught a foundation. He taught fundamentals. And then when he left, you know, Robert Lansdorp comes in, and he talks like Rocky Balboa. I remember saying to Telsher, uh, you know, does he still talk to you the same way? And he goes, yeah, he still talks to me the same way. With, um, you know, he had a player's lounge. Jean Austin was a big part of that. Um, she ran the pro shop, and she organized match play. You know, really, that's a perfect scenario if you could teach people to have great ball striking technique and then find match play. I think that's one of the toughest things right now that was better years ago when people took a private lesson. You take one private lesson a week and then call people up and say, hey. and that's where kids were going out and hitting a half-hour cross courts. Let's go half-hour forehand to forehand, half-hour back into backhand. I mean, now, when I was a kid, I remember going up and uh, just playing with adults. Yeah. And just going out there and uh, getting thrown in there, play singles with adults, playing doubles with adults. So. But to circle back, you took private lessons. Yeah. It wasn't like you went to a program every day after school. Right. So we use the phrase programmed out. And we go on and on. There's no ball. There's no backboards being built. There's a, there should be ladders. There should be a city ladder. There should be a true city championship. They used to do that in Boca Raton. It would be based on six weeks. 
oh, I think it was maybe it was seven one year, but six weeks because someone would obviously one of the better players would be out of town for a wedding. It would be something they'd have to do, family related, business related. But you had uh, you had to get the director's approval. If if you, you didn't get the round done in the first week, hey, can't you know it's going to be played on the Monday of the second week, and then I play. And if I win, I'm going to play and. You know, just have a true city champion. And then from that, you do, do it once a year, then you have a ladder. Um, you, you know, you've been in the South Florida area long enough for that. It was amazing. You know, I just start, if I went to Miami, and you could name all of them. I think of uh, Flamingo Park. And then there's so many all from North Miami, South Miami to North Miami. Then you get to Hollywood, and you have David Park. And then you had Hollywood, um, Jimmy Everett now. Jimmy Everett Tennis Room was called Holiday Park. You know, up here in Boca, we had Memorial Park, and that's where all the players were. And now the players don't congregate like they used to. And you're, you know, sitting around watching each other play. That doesn't happen so much either. I mean, I remember in the area that I grew up in, in, in Miami out, out west, I mean, that used to be a very fertile ground for Division One talent. I mean, the amount of players that came out of um, you know, my old high school, you know, once, once I left, actually, they, they went on a streak of, uh, of winning state titles. I mean, and you had, you had teams that had like Alex Bogomolov that was, you know, you had like Luigi DeGord that was a uh, top player at UM and you had, and then on the women's you had, you know, Joanne Song Song who played at Texas, you had Melangelo Morales, you had a bunch of, uh, really high-end talent in West Kendall. And now when you go out to West Kendall, you know, I heard someone tell me a couple of years ago that my old high school has no team. So, you know, literally in the span of uh, 20 years, you've just completely, that entire area just died off when it came to tennis. And, it, and, it, and it's crazy because the athletes are still there, right? They're just playing, uh, you know, they're just playing soccer now. They're playing. Um, the talent pool is yeah. deep. It's there's all there. sort of, there's lots of all sorts of people that could put it together and become great tennis players. I like the the story and you can just you know tell stories from the line, I guess. The headline or the title of the story could be if if he can do it, I can do it. If she can do it, I can do it. And yeah, that's where the junior development program needs to be a train. You know, people need to give back. They don't just need to take. So the 18-year-old should be pulling the 16-year-olds and all the way down 16 to 14s. And all the older kids, say if they're 12 years old and they're playing tournaments, they need to help out the early childhood development classes. And it needs to be community. It needs to be that type of culture. It's One, amazing because, sorry to interrupt, but basically, you know, I, I went to this coach for very little, maybe a few months, but there was a coach in Miami, Saki Balapas, and he basically was running a program on four courts that were part of a – homeowner association and he basically had kids coming out there on weekends like at eight in the morning you know they'd stay there until four o'clock in the afternoon and they train till 11 30 12 they'd hop in his van go to the burger king across the street you know pass time there for two hours then come back play some more and end the day with a run and you know from that program i mean saki must have had uh, you know, if I had, I mean, probably twenty Division One players at the minimum, at least during the time that I remember being there. So let's say from the time that, from the time I was twelve to twenty years old, you know, at least twenty, maybe, probably more. And you know, he was also he was probably most well known for working with Kim Sands, uh, and then she went to UM and played professionally for a bit, but. Uh, you know, he had a lot of success, and it was basically that. It was nothing fancy. Everybody uh, was welcome to play there. You know, you were taking a private lesson with him. It was, I mean, I want to say it was $35 for two hours. Wow. I mean, that could be, or maybe it was one hour, but I want to say it was two hours. And basically everybody else was out there just with, like, milk cartons full of balls, and they were just hitting. And every, and I just remember every kid having a slice backhand, every kid being able to volley, and every kid being able to serve. Um, I don't remember them having all great forehands, but I remember everything else, but they were just, 
they love tennis. They were out. They love the environment. They had, you know, all ages. And I mean, and he passed away about, I want to say, five years ago. And I mean, the the amount of people that showed up at his at his funeral, you know, spanned across decades. You know, and I went, and I, like I said, I was barely. I worked with him for maybe a month or two, because I was always at with uh, with my coach Pat that was down the street. You know, mainly because of the friends that I had there, but um, and then afterwards, I moved on. But I mean, it's amazing how that model, as simple as it was, isn't re- recreated anywhere else. You know, and I've tried. I've tried to go out there now that I'm back in that area doing uh, with the kids groups. You know, we've got some kids that are just great kids. We've got some schools that are like Belen, where my brother is the coach. You just get just quality kids. I mean, you just come across like top rate individuals which is rare in Miami nowadays but um, you know I'd love to see that West Kendall tennis really take up again because it's funny I, I don't know how long Steve Denton has been uh, the coach at uh, I think 17 years I think he's so basically one of the first guys that I was hitting with when I just got out of college was Sean Madden and he went to uh, Texas A&M he was one of the so he must have been before uh, Steve got the job there Let's say Sampras. So Sampras something helped launch his career. I don't know if he qualified. I don't think he got a wild card, but he's playing Indian Wells and he played played Telsher. And he's thinking, I can play this guy. They they both played at the, at the uh Jack Kramer Tennis Club. That happened to my son Connor. He played uh Rather to Hart. Rather to Hart is I think six years older. But there's no off factor. Right. And it happened to be Ryler didn't sign up for a tournament. And he played the qualies, so Connor was in the qualies. Ryler lost to St. Connor, but he ended up as a lucky loser winning the tournament, Ryler. But yeah, not to have the off factors. Billie Jean King did. Um, if you can see it, you can be it. But that, that's something that's very difficult in the U.S. You know, these, these kids that are from, tennis players are from small countries. Say there's 10 million people and there's from... You know, you can get on a train and go from one part of the country pretty quickly. Many times there there are round players from from that country, and you know that's one of the big of the five E's is exposure. It's it's got to be enjoyment, but it's not hitting the giggle fun. It's education, experience, exposure, and environment. I told someone I wrote a report today. I watched a player that I worked with. He needs to build a game, his game around his serve. You know, he's a big kid. He's going to get bigger. He's got a great serve. So I said to him in this report, I said, start your day with a serve or start your practice with a serve and end your practice with a serve. But I think also, too, to tell some kids, you know, start your day in the gym, end your day in the gym. Um, You know, I I really think the kids should start their day in front of a mirror and end their day in front of a mirror. You could do it. Okay, this is five minutes, two and a half before you leave the house and two and a half when you come back to the house. And that that would be a routine. It's okay if you do that. I, t- I tell kids, you know, hitting a ball off of stationary tee, you know, we say own the cone. It's accepted in baseball. I'd like to see that, that, that show that's on uh, Derek Jeter. That's out now. But um, I can remember watching, because we worked right next to the Yankees for 15 years, and watching Derek Jeter Okay, I don't know baseball, but this guy's supposed to be one of the best. And, you know, he's he's got a swing coach next to him and he's hitting the ball off a tee. And it's like, okay, why don't we get why don't we get that in tennis? Well it's interesting to hear you say that the Illinois guys were working in front of a mirror. I remember a few years ago when you made a post uh on Facebook about uh working in front of a mirror and you had people, you know, top former top 100 pros going out there and, and being critical of it. So, you know, I don't know how you could be critical of it if, you know, five years before. Oh, I know. It was uh, filmed at Dave Anderson's place in Brookhaven. Right. It, I mentioned Shiori Fukeda. She she was doing it with Petrus Kukimura's daughter. Um, and, um, yeah, but, you know, when, you, when, when tennis people see static training now, it's, like, shocking. When you see tennis people, tennis players shadow swinging, it's shocking. It's it, 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 so many things have gone away that were just accepted protocol before. And 
I mean, what's interesting also is that you basically go out there and you're you're copying other sports in the sense of copying the cross training aspect, copying the the nutrition aspect, copying the mental training aspect, and then they ignore like what you're saying in baseball where they're working with a swing coach off a co off a tee, or in hockey where they're working with um, you know just skating, or you know, NFL teams, the the run through that they do the day before the game where they're just going out there and just, you know, without being in pads and they just run through the plays that they're gonna run the next day. So why is it in in other sports it's so common and in tennis anything that doesn't involve grunting and hitting it as hard as you can is sort of frowned upon. So it just doesn't make any sense. It just uh I spent very little time around the New York Rangers, but there was a time where the Masters was played in Madison Square Garden. So my brother set me up with tickets, and it was just, I was in. I could watch the practices in the felt forum. But during that time, I saw, I saw a lot of Rangers games. And of course, during that time, the Rangers, they'd have a skate on a day where there wasn't a, a game. They're, you know, they're perhaps at a morning skate from 11 to 1, and they're all at the same place to have lunch at 2, but they didn't leave till 2 in the morning. You know, they were there for 12 hours. <laughs> drinking beers, but uh, but I can remember being in that situation and having watched a Rangers game, then being, I'll just tell a Ranger, you know, uh, Mahoney, Dave Mahoney, uh, he, remember he worked at Bobby Orr's camp, I remember just telling him, didn't you learn anything when you were at Bobby Orr's camp? Here's a guy who's playing for the New York Rangers. And at that time, I'm a tennis bum in Boca Raton, Florida, trying to learn how to play tennis, learn how to teach tennis. And I'm going, didn't you learn anything by watching Bobby Orr play? I mean, you need to be able to slide the puck and uh, but in hockey, you're just constantly criticized. You know, you, you you platoon. You're out there for 45 seconds. You come to the bench. You look straight ahead. The coach comes by. You know, and there can be a pat on the back, but there's more kicks in the fanny. They tell you what you're doing wrong, and you just get to the point where you understand criticism. Right. And I do think that's a problem where, you know, like, you know it's been mentioned in this podcast before. Because but kids are just killed with kindness. It's like, are you kidding me? Are you really going to volley that way? But, but the thing is, is then they don't even volley. You know, right. you, you, you film them and you go, really? That's how you volley? But that's ah, not a problem. I don't volley anyway. Well, I mean, that's the other problem with, uh, you know, for anybody like yourself that's trying to go out there and make uh, real inroads into changing the culture of mechanics and technical swings, you know, I remember when I would run tournaments with the orange ball and I would just see kids just absolutely smack the orange ball as hard as possible and it can't go out. So, you know, it looks, to the untrained eye, it looks great, right? It looks, they're playing, they're running. You know, if you have an athletic kid, then it becomes a little bit like pickleball, right? Like it's easy to, to just jump in there and play and be an athlete and just move the ball around. But, you know, I really, I remember I had a group of kids that were, you know, especially one girl, and she grew up with the, you know, within the Vicky Duval. We've mentioned to you Athena before, you know, with Madison Keys and Sloan Stephen. You know, they were all in that same age group, either up a year, down a year. You know, there were so many good players. I mean, when it came to those girls, there were so many good girls in that group. And you're not going to tell me that when they were 10 years old that they were going to be playing better than they were if they had an orange ball in their hand. I mean, there's no way. So... It just seems like if, if you're fighting, you know, like what you're saying, you're fighting ignorance every day. I mean, it's hard to beat, uh, you know, somebody just being enamored by watching, you know, a rally. Forget about the actual, that it won't translate to a yellow ball, but it's just, but it looks good. So it's someone, hard to... someone uh, earlier today, um, talking to Glennon Schaefer, who's the GM of FM Tennis, and Tomas Olish, his name came up, very, very good player from Sweden. He was a tennis tech or a student of mine. He had a great line, I use it all the time, is remember tennis is a fishbowl. There's no filtering system. You are swimming in, da 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 da. We won't swear in the podcast. But with that, you know, coming from a hockey background, hockey family, hockey people have a BS detector. I don't think that tennis people have a BS detector because there's so much BS. Oh, my father was the same way with soccer. I just was too, you know, I wasn't smart enough to appreciate what he was telling me at a young age. But I mean, if I had more of a soccer background like he did, 
it would have been very obvious. You know, you mentioned Vicky Duval, great kid. Um, I worked with her brother, their uncle Rudolph. He lived in Tampa. So we have film of Vicky. So she comes to me. She's the one who said, because her brother was always shadow swinging, his serve, his forehand, and she still told her, her mother that she needed to come and work on her serve. So she shows up. She just wants to play the U.S. Open. I said, well, don't go play any tournaments. Just stay here, work on your game. You know, it's four months, six months away. And then go, you can get a wild card and go win the juniors. And that's what she did. Now, with Vicky, when for, she made changes, and we have all this, cha we have film of when she changed her strokes. And we tried, actually, one of our friends uh, who's done quite well in business, somebody trained to teach tennis, was going to sponsor her. No strings attached. But, you know, and she, and she, you know, I can remember she's going off to do a function with Billie Jean King and Elton John, and, and uh, there was a lot of family circumstances, but um, it was actually Brandon Flanagan. Flanagan, it was set up for him to be the coach, but he wanted to uh, be able to hand in a two-week resignation where he was working. And it was at the, he was working at the Delray Beach Tennis Center. But she got a wild card. Now, here's somebody who had wins over Madison Keys and Jeannie Bouchard and in the, in, in the juniors. But oh. she but she did it with the it thing. Right. You mentioned Rachel Rohrbacher. It's a funny story to digress. But Vic, Vicky was training with us. And this lets you know what kind of great mind she had. And I didn't want her to meet Rachel Rohrbacher. So she's Vicky's there hitting off a cone, swinging a sock, drop hitting balls in the alley. And I said, you don't know Rachel, do you? You know, there's like 20 kids out there. And she goes, everybody knows Rachel. I go, what do you mean? And she goes, wait, just listen. And like four seconds later, because Rachel's playing some sets to get ready to go to Florida sectionals, she just yells out, Rachel. She yells out her own name when she misses the shot. And then Vicky's just laughing. I go, okay, so you know who Rachel is. But you haven't talked to her, right? Because we had a meeting with Rachel and her mother, Christy. And I said, I want you to talk to this girl. She's going off to play at the Florida 16s. Vicky won it when she was 10. She won the Florida section was at 10. I knew when I met her. I met her when she was seven. And it just, the kid just had no stage fright. She just had the it thing. But anyway, she, we have this film of her changing her game. And she had some results, you know. She remember her beating uh, Sam Stoser. Stoser kicks her serve. And I go, take that return early. And he said, she's going to run around her backhand. So they hit a forehand. He hit her forehand. I have to tell me it's fact checker. I believe she's right handed, so is her right. Yes. And, you know, so she's going to love moving to her left. Just keep hitting the ball high to the right, high to the right. And, you know, you're, you know, sure, you're the underdog. Coming back to Roberto Callow, who says, he watches someone hit balls, he has no information. He just tells a kid, I mean, people don't realize that he was around us for 15 years and he had said so much to do with taking players from being at this level to that level. And, Roberto will tell people, remember, just play the tiebreaker test. So day one, we people put people through the tiebreaker test. Cross court deep, cross court deep, down line approach shot. And we obviously know that you need to be able to play a cross court approach shot, but can you just put those six shots together, knock an overhead out of the sky? Now, I think Andy has added to that where Andy Fitzell, instead of taking the volley cross court, we do that first in the beginning. We do that in the beginning just to teach them strategy. But yeah, to think the first volley deep because you can really improve technique. And then people just don't know. If you can make one volley, singles or doubles, your tennis just skyrockets. But um, especially someone, who, Vicky, um, she might have been 16. Might have been when 16. Won, when she won San Diego? Yeah, so yeah. she was young. And, and the thing was is that... Well, she might have, I think she was a November birthday, if I remember. She, in the final, she beat the girl whose father played for the Miami Dolphins. Alley kick. Yeah, so, but when people make a change in their game, you know, um, Dr. Patel, Mallory Patel, who's helped us with the podcast, he needs to play his forehand at waist level. You know, you can work and work and work, but in the match play, he sent his father a video not too long ago, maybe I'm repeating myself again, is that you're, you know, get some blood pressure medicine. Your kid's still hitting his forehand at his shoulder level. So it's, it's, so many things um, with, yeah, I do think that's important to, uh, for parents to know. In tennis, it's very difficult to find fact-based instruction. Very difficult. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, 
I sent you a family here recently. I think and you told me that you've begun teaching the, the mother how to how to structure their the kids' practices. So, I mean, it's really the, it's seemingly the best way because you know no one's going to care as much about the kids' development than one's parent, and it can basically the more information that they have, the easier it's going to be to sort of see the whole process. Now, can you manage the the day to day? You know, duties of parent and coach, that's a different story. But at least having information and being educated can kind of, uh, as you say, you know, help you sniff out the BS and basically know what, what's being taught as being helpful. You know, a positive from Rick Macy is he stands up for, uh, I'm going to guess it's the late Jim Pierce, Mary Pierce's father, you know, labeled the tennis player the tennis parent from hell. I do think a lot of tennis parents, they don't want to be labeled. You know, I don't want to be the bad guy, the good guy. I do think in today's society, the parents want to be their kid's buddy too much. I'm always telling parents, you really don't want to be your kid's friend until they're an adult. You know, you need to be the parent. You don't need to be the buddy. With, But the parent writes a check. The parent should be the boss. Family's the one who gets the player down the road. But a lot of times, people don't have the time but they really shouldn't make the time. We make videos, as you know, slow motion analysis, every stroke. You know, we do match play, skill testing, film it, document. And the parents sometimes, you know, some parents, they watch it more than the kid. But do both parents watch it? And then do they say, well, I've watched it, you've watched it, now we're gonna watch it together. You know, now let me see your notes. I mean, we have less than 15% of the people who we make a tape for send us notes. That's on the parents. You know, they're, write, they're writing the check. I mean, you got to listen. Okay, the guy said, send us notes. Where are the notes? I actually came across, um, so I mean, I've probably brought you, I don't know, 10, 15 players over the years, 10, 20 maybe. Yeah, I'd say closer and, to 20. And it's basically, been a long time. It's been 10 years, right? But, uh, but I mean, uh, you know, like I, I feel like I only brought them when you were out in, uh, when, you, when you got to Happy Lane. You know, I obviously I visited you a lot when you were out at Mooresville. Uh, I didn't make it out to Memphis, but. Uh, yeah, in the last years. But, um, you know, I came across uh, uh, Grego, your Deerfield Academy buddy. He, I actually came across his notes the other day, and then you know the one I was telling you about my college teammate uh, Federico uh, Nicholas. Also, you know, so of all the kids that I brought, you've got uh, two kids that I can definitely vouch for that had notes. So, yeah, I mean, going back, we we talked about having a podcast, different chapters. One thing I'm pretty spoiled where I I could move tomorrow, and like today we had an even 20 and we didn't have one kid from Florida and there's no advertising, it's just people calling up and yeah, yeah, you can come on down. We'll help you with your game. Um, but no, we were in, I was in North Carolina. There was a group of Canadians through Richard Hernandez that, you know, flattering my ego that like to build a real estate, a, a residential pro, you know, properties, homes and name it Tennis Smith Village. Then I got right. to pick the city, so I picked Raleigh. And then it was it was a family who built uh, a beautiful center outside of uh, Charlotte. And then you know within a very short period of time, we talked to a few millionaires that were ready to buy the land next door. Well, that that area is pretty. You know, I've got a buddy of mine, uh, you know, Brian Rosenthal, that uh, plays in the pro league out there. It seems super competitive. I mean, they've got uh, a lot of different teams that are. Well, it's a great state. I mean, Charlotte, I believe, uh, may still be the fastest growing city in the U.S. Oh, there needs to be pre-academies. But, you know, it was just on the radar. Um, you know, the, it went from the front burner to the back burner, but the gentleman um, who was going to lead the way, I mean, the, the guy who could write the biggest check. Here in Florida, it's just different. There's, as you know, there's an academy on every street corner more than 7-Elevens. But in some areas, there's there's not an academy. But actually, I think Kim Wittenberg said it as a guest on her podcast is, um, you know, the academy system's not working. 
it's not working. Last year at men's tennis, I'm not sure what women's was, but 63% foreign players. And, you know, the typical academy, we need pre-academies. Um, you know, I meet some people and you know, just recently some kids that, you know, in the past have been recognized with the USTA and the USTA is not inviting them back now, but, you know, it sounds so drastic, you know, to get people's attention, not to be sensation sensationalistic, but you watch a kid and you go, the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming right at them. You know, they don't have options. They just have hole after hole in their game. And um, it's pretty tough if, you know, um, you know the, you just think about it, the money being spent. But, you know, Luke Jensen, everybody ends up somewhere. And then people move on, and there's no accountability. It's right. like this large tennis facility with 20 courts, you know, Produced indoor, outdoor, players. What, have, what players have they produced? You know, then you can even go small city. And then, then also, too, probably the biggest problem is you have the merchant of flesh. They didn't produce the player, but they're right there. You know, now that the player is very good, you know, it's like the, the guys on TV, the gals on TV, not so much. Give them a break. But the guys, they have so much access to the pros, and they're really working it. And that's where you see a lot of TV commentators, they start to branch off and they coach, and then they'll bounce back and do commentating. Here's something with uh, get myself in trouble. Serena Williams was paid by Patrick Mortigal $1.5 million a year. I'm guessing, and Patrick's got, there's a lot of positives. Okay, he's like Nick Kyrgios, you know, Nick is going to put people in the seats. Let's find the positive side of that. Patrick, what he's doing for tennis. But I would bet dollars to donuts, and maybe that's not a good line anymore because a donut costs more than a dollar. But that Patrick is paying Simona Halep. I would just bet the house on that. That's how tennis works. And I mean, the Instagram uh, post by Patrick is tough to tough to listen to. I learned I learned nothing about the slice serve and the volley in the last uh, in the last month from him. No, I did a project that he funded. You know, went over to France and I was interviewed on this story by GQ magazine, Vanity Fair. This young kid I was working with, uh, Patrick was funding him. Baghdad has saw him hit balls and said, hey, this kid, it's kind of like Arthur Ashe found. Uh, I actually met that kid. He came to play one of my tournaments. Yeah, I've talked to him since. Later. He's playing college tennis now, but he was out of college tennis for a long time, Jan uh, Silva. I, I have a film of Connor and him doing amazing things. The kid kid hit a tweener when he was five. I saw Patrick on film today hitting with a five-year-old kid, and Patrick goes, this kid's a genius. And the kid is pretty, 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 pretty impressive for five years old. I mean, I get so many things. I know you send me, you know, hey, look at this. I, I mean, I, I'm, a lot of ways, it takes a lot of time, but people send me a lot of things and to look at videos. So with, with Patrick, um, yeah, with Jan Silva, you know, Bagged out of some hit balls and said, hey, this kid's the real deal. But he, he's the kind of kid who you, know, you buy all sorts of toys with and they just want to bang two pans together. But his mother from Finland, she played tennis really well. And father was, I think he could high jump seven feet or whatever. And he played big time college basketball. And so Patrick was betting on the genetics, among other things. And the kid just loved hit ball. So he had a very good hit skill level. Now, they had already popped in to see me before they went to Braden. But then they went to see Braden. Braden said, I know this guy in Florida. Again, I was flattered. Yeah, I think you had him in tennis intelligence applied, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How to talk to a kid and and hit, you know, you could yeah, we have lots of film of him when he when he was a young kid. You know, you document development. This is how he was hitting the ball when he was under our watch. With but you know, then the you know, this stay the course. Stay the course. And but anyway, it was a story was uh the player the, the players, I shouldn't say the representatives, people on his executive team. They were going to Miami anyway, but they came to Tampa and they were there enough for me to have three meals with them. And it was so funny where, uh, I mean, I do have my ego where they, they said, you do a good job, but we have a thousand people in Paris to teach just like you. And I said, no, no, there's only 800 people to teach tennis in Paris at my level. You know, it's, but you're no, all, I mean, you're all about math, right? Yeah. He did say that to me. Um, you're all about math and tennis is art, you know, and it's both, it's both an art and a science, but with, 
Um, but, you know, he's on American TV. He's a clever, clever guy. What, he's probably the best marketer. He's better, probably a better marketer than Dennis Vandermeer was, the late Vandermeer. So now he's everywhere. He's a better marketer than Nick Balteri. He's like the girls are going out to the finals. Um, semifinals, I think, with Halep, right? She lost in the semis. Yeah. Well, Patrick's right there. He knows where the camera's going to be. You know, then he's being interviewed on U.S. TV, the U.S. Open. What are you working with, Serena? I'm helping her with her serve. <laughs> Pretty good answer. I think I'll take credit for her serve. So, um, but, you know, like, say, Tissy Potts, Patrick, he saw him play on YouTube, called the family in, and he doesn't change it. That's one thing that the Federation should learn from Patrick. Patrick's like a, like a Federation. He is a Federation. He's got, his father's a billionaire. Rob Krychek, who's a guest on our, pie check, on our podcast. If you take a $100 bill and go three feet, it's a million dollars. You need a billion dollars, and you're as high as the Empire State Building. So a billion dollars is just how much? You know, it's like these guys that are playing pro sports, and they're being paid in the millions, but there's a billionaire paying for that. Right. You know, it's just funny, funny money. It's like that Chris Rock line. Oh, what's that? Or was it that, uh, that the athletes aren't rich the uh the guys writing their job i mean i butchered the line but it's something about the owners are rich the players are just uh well paid i forgot what the line was but i remember my son mikhail he listened to chris rock and so i started getting all these questions about minimum wage and and i go where's this coming from chris rock i go oh, okay chris rock. i mean the, the the part that i would actually be interested in listening to you because you know now when you bemoan the the state of tennis currently you know, and you really love watching Federer. You know, part of me wonders if if you really love watching Federer because you dislike everything else that you see out there for the most part. You because know, I'd love to hear your, your own breakdown between, let's say, Federer and Sampras. Like, who's... I know you probably say that you like the Sampras volley more. You probably like the Sampras underspin backhand more. You'd probably like the Sampras serve, serve more. So basically, obviously, Roger checks out all the boxes as a personality and how he helps the sport grow. But from a tennis perspective, you know, I'd almost love to hear your, your thoughts on just that comparison. Well, a couple of things. First of all, Roger came after Sam Sampras, so thank you. Right. Whoever comes first. Uh, so Roger got to learn from Sampras. Sampras didn't learn from Roger. That's his logic, but, but also Sampras too learned from like the, all the old Australians. Well, that's where Pete Fisher. Hey, we're going to watch this film of Laver, watch this film of Rosewall. We're, people should know that. You know, he's a pediatrician. We're going to watch film of the very best players, and we're not so interested in junior tennis. His sister Stella was it's a famous story where, when he changed from a two-hander to one-hander, she said he couldn't beat a local high school player. But you know, Federer also grew up on clay. Federer also grew up in Europe playing soccer. Federer also was in Switzerland and as a kid he loved to ski. So there's so many things that made him. And Sampras is a great mover. I mean, Sampras is so fast. You think of Sampras' his body, he's a tall guy, but he's got these short, stubby legs. He's kind of like a Michael Phelps. His body, his, arm, his, his arms, talking about Craig Tyler, he had a kid, Jeff Lasky. I don't think Lasky's any taller than I am, but, you know, so I would go back, I'm going to guess that Lasky's hand went down to his knee. You know, Sampras could take his hands when you do that stretch for your shoulder. He could just clap his hands behind his back. So there's just so many things. Uh, Scott Reed is here, a great guy, loves tennis. He was a volunteer coach, and he's here this week. With his, now he's a dad. He's got three kids. He's here with his five-year-old daughter, just hanging out with us. And she's going through everything. She went to the beach today, was running, and she's just going to do the whole nine yards. And um, he asked me a great question, made me kind of stop at my tracks just, just last night, night before. He said, is it so bad or does it just bother you more now? And it made me just stop and think. And I think actually it's it's just worse than it was. Right. Well, back to the You know, but it's not, you know, like the kids are, you know, high school tennis has gone away. You know, I mean, I talked to a young boy today, just came out to practice. His dad asked if he could join. He said, yeah, you want to play a match. And he plays high school tennis. But then I spoke to the dad. He goes, well, you know, now the, the best players don't play high school tennis. And that's even a kid's homeschooled. You know, I think they should play high school tennis. Here in Florida, I think the rules changed, but it was at one point, if you just go to four matches, you can play in the state tournament. You don't have to go to any practices. You don't have to go to every match. Just play four matches, then you go to the states. 
that's just not right. I mean, that's just going to create prima donnas. We have a team. Everybody comes. This is the practice. You know, can you imagine a basketball coach saying, oh, yeah, kid, you don't have to come to our practice. You, you just, um, you, if you just play in four games, you can come and join our state tournament. I mean, tennis is whacked. Tennis is whacked. I mean, we need a commissioner. You know, pro tennis is whacked. College tennis is whacked. All the way down. We need to I get. I mean, we, we definitely lost our commissioner in Florida for juniors when Bobby Curtis was, uh, when he stepped away from, obviously passed away. But, I mean, I'm just when. He was just phenomenal at organizing things from from a junior perspective. But yeah, you, you he he, he was running tournaments when I played tournaments in Florida. Bobby, I, it was uh, very fortunate that a mutual friend of ours. I wrote a letter to Bobby during COVID. You, know, you couldn't talk to him on the phone because he couldn't hear you. But anyway, I I had a letter written and read by a nurse to to uh, to him. You know, he really fought for doubles. You know, there should there should right. be a larger percentage. Yeah. Um, either, I mean, he fought for doubles so much that one week in a month in Florida was only doubles tournaments. People took that week off. They took the week off. And it's, um, but that's where you, to me, I think it's, you know, Richard Hernandez, I mean, he's so, he's so, he's so emphatic about we need to take tennis to the schools. Right. No, I mean, that made a lot of sense and, and having it where, but again, have a commissioner at the school level, have a commissioner at all different levels because. It's it's a problem throughout, and then when you see kids getting, you know, maybe getting that good start at twelve, or getting the information at twelve, you know, it's maybe four or five years later than it should be. Yeah, so, the schools. I think you have to hit it from every angle. You, the attitude of the household. You've got to get, you got to reach the parents, and then what happens at a local tournament? I know you speak Spanish. I go well. You know, the locals talk to the locals. And the word loco in Spanish means crazy. Who's the smartest player at a 10 and under tournament? The parent of the kid who wins a 10 and under tournament. You know, they've got the wrong grip. They're running the wrong way. But, you know, maybe they're a human scoreboard. Maybe their focus is better. Maybe they right. have a stage parent. They started really early. But it's nothing to get excited about. You know, it's, um, you know, and it's really interesting with, you think of something on an individual basis you know, if a kid's going to go sing in the choir, they're going to go play music in a school assembly. You know, people don't think that they're going to Carnegie Hall. You know, they, it's, it's music and this is their level. They're just much more logical about it. Same thing with math. People are just illogical about tennis. I'm just going to note that uh, you must be very worried about your social media presence because you've yet to answer the Sampras Federer question. Are you worried about the Fed fans? Uh, Storming and uh, and uh, and being angry at you if you don't say their man is the best one. Well, with uh, every champion has their day, you know. I think you know Federer. I, what, a, what a smart guy. Just from a just from a stroke perspective, I don't strokes. I was going to say Federer. You know, he's had yes, he was told if you have three wishes, first wish is Nadal played soccer. Second wish is he had Wawrinka's backhand. You know, Wawrinka doesn't have as so much play. Third wish, smart guy. He goes, I'll, I'll save the wish. Uh, you know, f the Fed, um, the movement, the skill level, even, you know, 2017, where he says he played the best, you know, what, 20 minutes of his career, you know, and his father said, you were always chicken on the backhand side. You know, the, the Fed, you know, running around his backhand to hit his forehand into the Dallas forehand, lefty forehand, and then doing it in Djokovic is like near perfect backhand. Um, I do think that Roger Federer would even have more no, I agree. Wimbledon titles if they didn't change the grass. Uh, oh, I thought they didn't you change the grass. If he played a more aggressive. No, if he was managed by stats, he was asked. Andy Fitzell was in the room, and he was asked about charts, charting, and he said, "No, the only time I look at charts is when they, at Wimbledon, when I'm interviewed, they put the charts in front of me, the stats in front of me." And they said, the follow-up question: What about your coach? No, at that time Anacone was coaching. No, we just go on hunches. I do think that analytics has been, been blown out where I don't think people are doing that great a job with analytics. I think it's more hype. To me, I'm always going, the analytics we need to deal with are the numbers for the grip, the swing, all the basic tennis math. I mean, almost no one gets the racket. Vic Braid, almost no one gets the racket hit below the ball. Well, I agree with the stats because it's always the same stat that they seem to show at during Wimbledon when a guy loses the first set. He's spending more time behind the baseline. 
And when he's winning the second set, he's spending more time inside the baseline. And they just make it sound like the player just moved inside the court and just started, you know, they don't take into account that I'm sure the first serve percentage was much higher for that player. I'm sure the opponent has made more second serves. You know, they, it's such it's such a basic way to interpret stats that it's it's inferior basically. And then when you mention you know Bill Jacobson and you know it's just it's just so easy to be distracted by pretty cosmetics that Hawkeye can provide with the little stats and then but it's the interpretation of the stats that that I think is pretty weak. So I remember I got into a a little bit of a Twitter beef a couple of years ago with uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy, I believe his name is, the Brain Game. Brain Game, yeah. You know, he was comparing the stats of, uh, of Milos Raonic from from the previous year to this year, and he was like, well, the f points won on first serve are 7% less, and points won on second serve were, I don't know, say, let's say the same. And I'm like, he's played Novak and Andy Murray about seven times in the first three months of the year. And you don't take that into account because he didn't play any of those guys the year before, right? So it's like just little things like that, that it's such a, you know, you, you know whatever that saying is about stats that you can make it look, right. say whatever you want. I mean, but it just seems in tennis, it seems like such a basic way to interpret information. Whereas baseball, they've taken it the other way. It's so studied and so analyzed now you've got guys that are doing the shift, you know, on a continual basis. Or you have, or you have, uh, I think it's the Tampa Bay Rays that have that throw out like uh, seven or eight pitchers in a game. You know, they're just using a lot of relief pitchers. So, you know, that that's another extreme in the sense where baseball doesn't resemble the baseball that I knew about thirty years ago. But but in tennis, it's the complete opposite. It's just basically. Very generic. I mean, so I, I think opinion. one thing that happens in tennis, I think ties into this, is people edify one another. You're great. I'm great. Aren't you great? I'm great. We're both great. Aren't you great? I think that happens within the USTA culture. I mean, they just put out a, a video not too long ago. It's like we're doing awesome. We're doing great. And I think it should be the opposite. Right. You know, we're hey, we got to get better. You know, if you think about the, the NFL coaches. Uh, Better yet, the college football coaches, you know, they, they, they're, they're all going back to work. They're all going back to work. I mean, they're, the, the hours they grind. Oh, yeah, maybe Vince Lombardi. You know, we, we win on Sunday, we look at the film on Monday, and we, we walk out feeling like we lost. The commentators, they edify the players. You know, they're, I don't think, uh, Jimmy Aries, I think that, you know, he's taken some shots at players. I mean, I, I appreciate that. Like, just honesty, honesty, right, honesty. Um, Gilbert, at one point, I'd like to listen to Gilbert, but Gilbert was in the booth, and he had coached uh, Andy Murray. And, you know, Andy Murray at one time was playing more drop shots and approach shots. And, you know, so they had a little bit of a confrontation where Murray said, well, I thought you didn't like me to hit drop shots. And he goes, no, I don't like you to hit drop shots when you're behind the baseline. If you're inside the baseline, you can hit a drop shot. Uh, with uh, you know, the recent Wimbledon title, the Wimbledon tournament, the top Canadian, Felix. Auger uh, Alessian. Yeah, okay. You're, FAA. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Gilbert, he's a smart guy. You call him FAA. Is that, he's got a nickname. He's, he's, playing, he's playing Max Cressy. It's a lot easier to say AA and pronounce his name correctly. He's playing Cressy, and it's like, okay, I have to go to the net. It's my serve. It's on grass. I'm going in. First day. He should have been down to doing that when he was 10, 11, 12. You I'm just saying the first day of the tournament when the grass is. Okay, first day. Yeah. So, but you know, the girl who from Tunisia who was in the finals. Right. Are we talking the they're in the booth going, they're, they're, they're in the booth talking about she has such great touch. It's marvelous. It's magnificent. And I just think, and you brought up, you said, that, you know, we, we need to do that. Um, I mean, I certainly secondhand because I heard so many Jack Kramer stories. And at one time he was a commentator. Um, I spent, like, no time. I mean, I met Jack Kramer. spent, like, no time around Jack Kramer. I worked with his oldest son first. I trained his youngest son, under all under Vic. I'm just thinking, if, if, if Jack Kramer's in the booth and he's watching this girl stay back on her own serve hitting drop shots, 
you know, with, uh, I mean, even like a Donald Dell, oh, uh, I w- w- you know, when the old school commentators. I mention like, to the kids all the time. I'm like, when I was a kid growing up, Tony Traver was a phenomenal commentator. You know, you had guys like Arthur Ashe that were, that were critical as commentators. Now, if you go back and you listen on, on YouTube, you can see some of those old, uh, what it was called those old clay tournaments that were out in the Boca area where you have like Poncho Gonzalez commentating. So, I mean, you're getting all these ex players. That's yeah, great. That's on YouTube. Huh? I mean, it's fun to listen to. I mean, it's, uh, and, but they're really, they're really being critical. They're really studying the game. Almost like they're playing on the court versus just throwing out generic terms. And, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I know you've complained about this all the time and hearing the serve plus one, but take it a step further. You know, when you hear some of these uh, former female players talking about shape and margin, you know, they never hit toss in their life. So, you know, when you hear, it's, it's almost a, as if it's prepared words and you've given a script and, you, you know, you've got to say this, you know, three times every 20 minutes, but there is very little analysis. And I've mentioned to you before that what I would love if I can make a request for a podcast, I want to hear, and I don't know how many of the all-time greats you've actually been able to see closely, but you know, I want to know about Kramer. I want to know about Hode. I want to know about Gonzalez. I want to know about every single one of those players and break them down to the, you know, in your in your style of analyzing and breaking down. That's what I want to hear because I think I could do a pretty good job. Uh telling Vic Braden stories about those guys. Well, exactly. I mean, well, that's, uh, you know, and again, this is where I love listening to these podcasts generally because I mean, I love the history of tennis, you know, and I feel like too many people blow over the stuff that's happened before, you know, and I'm like I said, I remember sitting with uh, Jaime Fiol in his office in Chile. I remember sitting with, you know, Pato and Pato Pe and Pato Rodriguez at, at lunch i remember you know sitting with francisco and just i mean i remember francisco always talking about lou hode like if it was no doubt that he was the greatest player of all time so on a given day Braden used to say that the three franciscos for our listeners the late francisco right. and then his, the second francisco who played on the tour so fast played at georgia never didn't really have a great serve but he was fast as ever got to about Top 75, I'd say, in singles, and about top four in doubles. He's about the same age as Mary Jo Fernandez, right? I mean, I remember yeah, seeing... Yeah, exactly. I saw, yeah, I saw Francisco exactly. play the 12s in the Orange Bowl. And then, you know, through you, I had a chance to spend some time with number three, the son. But history, you know, then the question is that, I mean, I really think that Francisco number two should teach tennis like Francisco number one. Uh, you know... And it's not that I'm old school, but like we, we need to carry the torch from people who've gone before us. And I don't, as you said, you started off with the podcast history. Fact checker, I think Tony Traber from Cincinnati, he won in 1955. He won the French. And nobody won until Michael Chang in 89, is that right? So, but in Cincinnati, I've been to the Tennis Hall of Fame and with um, Barry McKay, Bill Talbert, Tony Traver, J.J. Wolf, Jeremy Wurtzman, who was just on as a guest in his own right, became number one in the NCAA. He's a very good player. And he told me that he's worked with Andy Fitzell and he's seen all this film. I know I've seen some of it for sure, is that of J.J. Wolf making changes in his game. And J.J. Wolf, I mean, he can jump through the gym. This guy's got strong legs. I think he has the it thing. He needs to go forward. He needs to back that game up. He needs to be able to play all three zones of the court. Bill Talbert, the books he wrote, it's almost like they're too advanced for tennis. Right. Um, so I think that's another thing. Um, you know, I'm excited. Supposedly I'm going to be, be sent some books from the Vic Braden Library because anybody who wrote a book gave Vic a copy. And the Tennis Channel, they weren't interested in the books. You know, they just oh, have the really. film. Um, but... <laughs> Um, you know, so a group of us really, you know, we, we hope some things around the corner by this upcoming January 2023 that we can do a better job carrying the torch. But J.J. Wolf is from Cincinnati, and what a ten, what an athletic family he's from. But 
I, I really think that everybody in his corner that are helping him out, he actually was here at the FM Tennis Performance Center because he played Delray Beach. I talked about getting him on a podcast, is he needs to back up his firepower with being able to play from the service line in. And so he's from Cincinnati. I go, well, there's three guys from Cincinnati who are top 10 in the world. What did they do? Right. What did they do? I mean, that's what they do in other sports. Like, okay, we got to study the best and forget the rest. So, yeah. I, I mean, with, with Federer, um, he's just so graceful. I mean, he's done everything right. Does the guy ever made a mistake and how he handles himself? But, you know, I cringe when I hear that Djokovic is the greatest player of all time. I mean, Djokovic is great, great, great. He might be Gumby. He might be the most flexible player, flexible player of all time. And granted, he's playing in an era where he's not playing doubles. I mean, Federer, you know, he won uh, Olympic gold. You know, he, like Nadal knows it was more of a fluke for him to win Olympic gold playing doubles. Nadal knows that. He, he was happier about winning because of that, because of his game style. But yet, um, you know, do, do people in tennis, the guardians of the game, go, we've got kids who can't play doubles. Well, if they can't play doubles, it's not like they're going to have an option of serving volley and going to the net. So... But I mean, I definitely am a Federer fan. Um, I would say that I'm more of a student of the game. I, I think Djokovic is great. But who I cheer for is I cheer for who I think will make tennis teaching easier. Correct, I get it. But I mean, let's say if Federer was around 30 years ago and he was playing next to Becker, Sampras, Edberg, Steek, uh, Krychek, uh, you know, I could throw out a zillion different names that had. Obviously, he's a phenomenal mover, but I just feel like the lack of other similar styles around it just makes him look at another level. I think one of the best speakers in tennis is VJ Armitrash. I've only had a chance to listen to him a couple of times. You know, but I don't think people really re respect it. He goes, I think Connors would, you know, and he, he was one who, maybe one of the only ones who said, Connors doesn't have that fast to serve. And he would attack Jimmy Sir more than other people. But, um, you know, Charlie Passerell said every champion has their day. But go to 1975, go to YouTube, 1975, Caesars Palace, just plug it in, Rod Laver versus Jimmy Connors. And it's, I mean, 1975, it's a lo lo long time ago. He was, he was almost totally retired. He, right. You know, he, he, he's amazing tennis. Uh, Steve, Steve Denton told me a story just the other day. He was a kid. He was a ball boy at the Red Clay Court Tournament in Houston. And he sat there in disbelief watching Rosewall and Laver practice with one ball. Ground stroke to ground stroke, volley to ground stroke, switch, ground stroke to volley, volley to volley, overheads out of the sky. Because they, they, they didn't have a bunch of tennis balls. You know, the more you have, the less you have. But, I mean, take it a step further when you talk about, let's say, the history of the game. I mean, you have got all these guys back there that you're talking about where every, maybe not every tournament, almost every tournament was best of five. No tiebreakers. You know, they're playing, and they're playing doubles. They might be even playing mixed. Um, they certainly played less on hard courts. The, the, grass is, the grass is tough on your legs. It's uh, a little so, tougher than the clay, but the hard courts. So then, and then, but then you look at, like, the current players – where the top stars are playing on the center court and they're never delayed by weather. They're always going to stay on schedule. They're going to be playing every other day. They're never going to have to do what, uh, you know, what was it, Agassi the year that Roddick won that he had to play like back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back days at the U.S. Open because of the rain. So none of these... Great... That's changed. You know, it's like in Australia. The guys in the booth edifying everyone. It's not fair. You know, the heat index that right. players are playing outdoors and some players are playing in the air conditioning. Right. That's not right. With, you know, wooden rackets, you know, we, we encourage kids to play with wooden rackets. I think it's great how you said, hey, learn to play with your opposite hand for many, many reasons. But with the wooden rackets, um, Andy Roddick would have had a much more difficult time playing with a wooden racket than Djokovic just because Djokovic has overall better mechanics. Right. So um, I do think, you know, you mentioned 
Craig O'Shaughnessy, I think his article, it's the big lie, you know, the rackets today, the strings today, um, people can still come to the net. You know, Lopez, how many examples are there? What is Lopez's first name? Feliciano. Feliciano. And Judy Murray said... Deliciano. She said uh, Deliciano, right? Exactly, Deliciano. Deliciano, okay. Um, I'm sure she so, so there, the English accent than I do. So there is an example with, with a few players that do come to the net. But, but if you were to watch Feliciano on returns, he's playing more like he's playing on clay, probably, you know, in the style that he was growing up. But he's not, he's not attacking the net. You know, with reckless abandon like Cressy is, or or like how Sampras used to back in the day. So it's a little bit different, right? So that's and again, I I agree with you that I find it hard to believe that it can't work anymore. You know, yes, when it's when it goes bad, it's going to be ugly. Well, just like a green light point, though, people should watch Max Cressy. He's climbing the ladder pretty fast, and right. uh, you know, I've had a chance to um, talk to guys that were UCLA. Um, my son uh, with gear on. Marcus Giron won some national or won some smaller double tournaments. Uh, Mackenzie McDonald spent time with us. You know, people, you know, Max has still got to improve his forehand, but that you know, you know, he just is. He's working so hard and he's going forward. You would think that other people would say, "Okay, green light point, serve the body. I'm going to add that to my game." I mean, and you, I, me- you mentioned Vlander. Vlander is a guy who did that. I mean, I, I remember. Texting you from the Miami Open, watching uh, Sitsi Puss playing doubles. He's playing Serbian and staying back in doubles. And it was like, it didn't make any sense to me. So, you know, like, it's not being taught for sure because it, there's still a, there's still a place for it, right? I mean, take it to another extreme when you watch at the U, at Wimbledon and you see Harmony Tan just uh, you know drive Serena nuts with. You know the underspin forehand and, and backhands. Yeah, granted, Serena was her first singles match back, but you know that girl won three matches after that. It's not like uh, it was a one fluke sort of deal. So, I mean, there's definitely I think something out there for for players that play a different sort of style versus like the cookie cutter brand of tennis that you see on a regular basis. It's, um, but you know, it's gonna yeah, take it, someone like. It's going to take some, and again, you know, say what you want about Curios. He's going to do things differently, right? He's, it's going to be very tough to break. He'll be slapping forehands left and right, as you're mentioning. And he's a very good athlete. I mean, he can cover the court very well. But, I mean, it's a different type of style than than Cressy. I mean, it's. Well, one thing with Cressy, um, you know, he was at our place three weeks. I mean, you know, Andy Fitzell was on the road with them for several months. Matt Clore set it up. Matt Clore was working with them because he was contemplating, you know, was he going to be a U.S. player or a French player? His mother, I believe, is the American, played volleyball, I think, at USC, and he went to UCLA. Maybe I'm wrong with that. But so, but anyway, um, you know, he's on TV last week winning in Newport where the grass isn't, you know, it's closer to the grass of yesteryear. Right. But, you know, Stevie Johnson won the doubles playing with a kid who went to North Carolina, Bloomberg. Bloomberg. But, you know, Raven Claussen is playing with Mello from Brazil. And, yeah, we're, you know, he's 39 years old. That'd be good for the old man Raven, you know, someone from our corner. Steve Johnson, senior. I love uh, his line, tennis lets you know who you are. Just tell kids that, like, weekly. Tennis lets you know who you are. And then I back it up with the hockey guy, Fred Shiro. Tennis sport doesn't build character, reveals character. But Stevie Johnson, you know, you got to give the guy credit. But, you know, it wasn't, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, he's the most decorated college tennis player of all time. But a lot of the players who played, they didn't play all four years, you know, which he did. Right. Obviously a great team guy. They won team titles. But the backhand side, you know, serving, staying back. So I – you know, so I don't want to pick on Stevie Johnson. I know he did on a podcast one time where he was probably doubles, but I, I was watching him play with Ray Atwood. I just got done watching him play with Austin Krychek. But say the Williams sisters, Billie Jean King at one time, and they listened to Billie, but Billie Jean King said, what are you two doing? But when you think about the Williams sisters, you have superior athletes playing an inferior system when they play doubles. And, you know, so winning's not confusing. It's totally confusing. So people are watching that. Well, this wins. Um, 
John Isner and Query were being interviewed. Andy Fitzell was in the room, and they, they were asked about serving volume. They had just gone, they'd taken a set from the Bryan brothers. And here are two giants with giant serves. And they were emphatic going, if we serve in volley, there's no way we take a set from the Bryan brothers. Well, fair enough. Okay, that's, that's how they play. That's how they've grown up in tennis. Uh, I remember telling Paul Broder, I said, the, the Sam Queries of the future need to volley better. You know, just like, say, Curios. How many people are looking at Curios and be critical? Can you imagine if this guy could volley? You know, and, well, he's in the Wimbledon final. How could you say that? Right. And I do think the commentators, the, the, there, there needs to be a school for tennis commentators. I have always said, we're going to have an ad for tennis commentators. No one's going to come. It's going to cost me a lot of money. I'm going to put the ad in Tennis Magazine and put it on the Tennis Channel. School for tennis commentators, and they're not coming. And who, who are they hiring? People, the American public is not learning tennis because they don't have – Vic Braden tried. You know, you know I, mean, I mean, Vic used to come back and – Chris Cliff Drysdale is, you know, still going strong at 80. And well, it's yeah. interesting, say because uh, you, you're watching these big matches, and the and the voice you might hear the most is Chris Fowler, who's not a tennis guy. So basically, now granted, maybe he sometimes gets paired up with uh, with someone that is tough to listen to, so he feels the need as a professional to kind of take the lead. I get it. But, I mean, here he's with Patrick McInerney, John McInerney. These guys should be able to provide plenty of content for him to just sit back and be like, uh, you know, the point guard in the booth, basically, just to... Yeah, but it's like, it's why did they hire Wozniacki? I mean, um, I'm a good-looking blonde. I mean, she's a good-looking blonde, but why didn't they hire me? Um, and, yeah, it's... The, the, the TV commentating, I mean... Hopefully the tennis channel, I mean, they, they hit a home run with that piece they put together with Vic Braden, but it's just like junior tennis. There's fact-finding information and there's bleacher talk. There's, on the TV, there's fact-finding information and there's small talk. Um, you know, granted, I could see where you could say, well, it's, you know, it's during the tournaments and, you know, we have our four Super Bowls and um, are you going to really criticize someone that's perhaps not the place to say, hey, you know, it's it's too bad that kid didn't learn to hit a, a better serve. Um, yeah. What else you got? We could wind this thing down here. Yeah, no. Uh, I think we could have a list of all our hundred podcasts. Um, I think that it's been great to have you on because it's it's it served as a review. Uh, but if we just went through, um, I got many many emails uh, this last I don't know, 10 days or so because we reposted on a Facebook. Uh, I didn't realize, I, I forgot that we had two parts on, on Peter Burwash. Yeah. Um, you know, he just passed away for right. our listeners. I mean, the one, I kind of viewed the all your podcasts in like the different little sec sections, basically. I mean, obviously we had the, the forehand, the backhand, the overhead, the volley, the serve. That was very interesting. Then you had the pillars, then you had the students or, or the disciples of the, of the pillars. I found that to be really interesting. So, you know, you've had a lot of different types and, you know, and then you've got guys that are going out there trying to grow the game. You've got these high school coaches that are going out there trying to, to grow game at a level that, you know, I, we were talking about earlier. I mean, I have a former coach of mine whose daughter played on the Doral Academy team and Ruben, uh, he's going out there posting, these are the greatest high school team ever. And I mean, I saw some great high school teams when I was in high school and I mean, it's not even close. I mean, I'm talking about some teams that I saw when I was in high school that were sending all five guys to the top teams in the country. So, and I'm sure there are, you know, I think it was, was it Cardinal Gibbons that had like uh, a phenomenal high school team? I, I know my buddies are gonna hit me up later if I got the wrong school, but uh, it's just I don't think it's any comparison to what I see right now in high school. I mean, you might have one or two guys on a top high school team that that are gonna be top college players, but the rest are gonna struggle to make a D one lineup. So, well, the team, you know, what happens in America is the individual becomes bigger than the program. The individual becomes bigger than the team. When I worked for Braden, 
um, fact checker, Corona Del Mar. I found a way to get over there in my van, which I lived in, travel all over the country. I went one to the Andy, uh, by the lake, by the river. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or in the van by the river. It What's does it very the well. The name of the comedian. Uh, Chris Farley. Chris Farley. Uh, I live in a van down by the river. So um, I was offered the job to be the assistant high school coach, and it was the money was not a fat. It was not. I mean, I, for, initially for Braden, I was working for free, working nights. It wasn't about the money, but it was about the time. So I, I couldn't pull it off. At that time, they wanted me to work at the Braden College, and I was working there, and I couldn't pull it off. Where um, with um, Corona Del Mar. Um, to do both, but th they had a player who he um, he was on TV playing for the Mexican Davis Cup team, and he played was playing three on this high school team. Um, yeah, it was certainly that was a different time, but um, I mean, I, I want to say my high school team. I'm sorry, my high school. A few years after I left, I want to say that it was. I might get the order wrong also. So I know it was Alex Bogomolov who's one. You know, it might have been Eric Heckman too or Luigi DeGord. I feel like Luigi DeGord got better in college. I think he was like a top 10 player in the country at UM. But I feel like in high school, he might have been below those guys. So, I mean, just right there, you've got three guys that were very, very good, better than what I see most of these uh, high schools now. So, and that doesn't even count like uh, the Cardinal Gibbons that I believe. Like Rudy Rake was on those teams, and uh, you know, obviously you got like those teams from the Balotelli era, so area. So find it hard to believe that any of these teams right now are are anywhere. You know, and you can honestly say possibly the same thing about some of the college teams, right? Like those UCLA teams back in the day was it with Jet Connors, and you know maybe they were only there a year or two, but uh, you know those were some stacked teams that you had back then. Well, fact checker, I know the clay courts, uh, maybe it was the 16s, maybe it was 16s and 18s, but one of the two tournaments had a draw of 256. Now, just a, years ago, I lived in Texas for 10 years, just to get to Texas sectionals, but there was someone in the Houston area who ran a camp that said, I wish I was at sectionals. And it was just a statement, you weren't good enough to go to sectionals. And then because of that, then someone came up with the idea, I'm going to run a camp, I wish it was at Kalamazoo. But to let 256 people in, you know, there's a lot of very, very easy matches. I, I mean, I saw a couple matches at the Clay Court Nationals, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but it was not a national tennis match. So again, when you make it easier for someone, you know, I mean, Bobby Curtis, for example, you mentioned when the USTA came out with level twos and level threes, you know, national tournaments. Now here in Florida, now they're, they're it used to be the different sections. Texas was a major zone. Here it was a designated, a different name. So it gets, right. it gets confusing. But it was much better when you had to stay at home, play tennis in your backyard. Parents were spending less money. Right. So then, you know, now kids are homeschooling, and it's like, well, here's the checkbook system. And I know kids that have gone to weaker tournaments hoping to get points. And then also, too, the way it works out, maybe I'm wrong, but there's still times where you can sign up for four tournaments and then you wait to see what tournament you get into. And, and then at the very end, you have to buy a flight, so you've been waiting, you, couldn't, you didn't buy the flight ahead of time. So it's just a, it's a nightmare. Like, who's, who's making the decisions on all this? And that's but, another reason where tennis is just um, and the so real expensive. Sad, sad part to see is that, uh, you know, I know. What bothers me is that you see like the junior tournaments in my eyes seem to have fallen off because you see way too many 15 year olds that are just going to sign up to play the Battle of Boca because they're just only focused on the UTR. I personally was a bigger fan of the tennis recruiting because I much prefer to know who was the best or the second best or the third best in the class of whatever. From a certain, you know, because that bottom line, that's what these kids are playing for is, is recruiting for college. You know, does it really matter if you're a, an 11.7 and I'm an 11.8? You know, and they make, you know, that, you know, they don't realize that every match is based on 
or your or your rating is based on your last thirty matches, unless they've changed the algorithm lately. But I mean, so you're talking about each match being worth three percent. One know, thing about people the, changing scores when they report the score to the tournament. I mean, it's just a disaster. One thing with the Battle of Boca for our listeners, it's a tournament every week at the county facility where Rick Macy has his his, his program. There's all different levels. You can really have a five playing a 13. Yeah, but they do a good job. I, I, no, they do a lot of things really well. With the tournament itself, oh, there's things that say, well, the backdraw shouldn't be the four, shouldn't, right, be, shouldn't right. be no ad. Correct. It shouldn't be so much money to play doubles. I mean, I, I go mean, that money, a, that money goes to the, that money's also being geared towards the prize money, so I get all that. But I'm just talking about, you know, I remember when I was in college, that was the first time I had heard because of the Spanish guys that are on our team, the amount of futures that they had in Spain, that they said, that, you know, there are 30 futures in Spain. You can just literally hop in a car, drive around Spain, and just play professionally year-round. I, I thought they had more than that. I mean, I mean, I could but, be, yeah. I could be wrong, right? 35, whatever it is. But so, in that sense, I do like the Battle of Boca. You know what they they provide because at least if you're a real player, you're going to go there and at least have. You know, I saw, I've seen, I saw. Was it Liam Drexel? Yeah. I saw him play Nico Godzik in the final. You know, good final. I think I saw uh, Bruno uh, and Victor playing it. So, I mean, you've got good level yeah. there. So, I mean, basically, if it's local like that, I mean, great. I agree with you with the back draw. I agree with you all that. But, I mean, but at least locally, that's decent. For, look at the rest of the junior tournaments. I mean, it's it's that's really hard to watch, in my opinion. I mean, the, the way that the, the level has dropped – you know, I think one thing about the Battle of Boca is a little bit, of, I mean, it's a little bit, it's a monopoly. It's hard court every weekend. And the beauty of South Florida is there's clay. Um, so it'd be nice if it was not always at the same facility. It'd be great. Even, you know, if Macy's got it going, you just, Macy, you get the tournament going at another site. But you're not buying an airplane ticket. Right. You're not checking into a hotel. If you could, you know, some people are coming here, they figured out, okay, I'm just going to go to Florida and play these tournaments. You know, another thing, too, is that p kids aren't playing one another during the week. They're just going and doing drills. It used to be that you'd get to play matches during the week. That's back with the old private lesson. You know, I do think with the tournaments, um, with, you know, juniors, you know, years ago, um, it's a little bit better now with the UTR that foreign players can come over and just play the UTRs. Years ago, foreign players couldn't come over and play certain USDA tournaments. Most USDA, most top USDA tournaments were not open to foreign players. So we're trying to prepare our own kids here in the U.S. to play college tennis. And the old system, they weren't really exposed to that. So now if, when kids come from overseas, you know, they can, there's no rules and regulations. Um, but I mean, I don't understand that. I know Australia is a partner with UTR. And now the USDA has not been. Now the the world pin number with the ITF and um, you know that it's, it's um, and I kind of question the algorithm because I mean we had the the boy from Argentina that you met uh, Nico and basically you know the kids that come from there their numbers aren't even anywhere near accurate you know it's only till they come here and they're playing other kids locally, you know, and they, they talk about a reliability factor and have to play a certain number of matches. But, um, you know, if it's true, if it's truly a mathematic, you know, it should be much more accurate than it is. It shouldn't need a kid to have to come all the way from Argentina to South Florida to play these tournaments to get them. Or, you know, obviously it probably works for other ITF tournaments, but, you know, for those kids that are not playing the ITFs, probably coming to Miami is the easiest option for them. But, uh, and I know that I spent time in Colombia. I think just now are they really starting to get some UTR things in Colombia. So you know, it, it seems like it's uh, it could be done a lot better. I mean, and I and I I kind of question the math behind it because I know the numbers have changed over the years, right? Like I know I've had girls that were, um, let's say elevens, you know, nine years ago. And now an 11 is a much higher level than it was nine years ago. So, the, you know, there's constant tweaking to that algorithm. Obviously, they don't release to that information. But, uh, I mean, we'll see. We'll see how that uh, the world pin number, if it works any better. But just the fact that, you know, a guy like Sampras, I go back to him or I go back to any big server. 
you know, they could theoretically break you once a set and win 6-4, six, 6-4, four, six, four, and the match was not close because you're, you are not breaking their serve, you know, and they, you know, so again, that's the part that it's a little bit unfair, right? Like you get some guys that are phenomenal returners that they can maybe crush an opponent two and one. That's great, right? Let's say, um, you know, curious. If you were to look at through the draw for Kira, actually, I guess he had some matches that were pretty routine, but Novak is way likelier to beat, to demolish people than Kyrgios. He's very likely to get to tie break. So penalizing a guy because it was 7-6 instead of 6-3, it seems kind of silly to me. But uh, He did beat up on the commentators. Chris Everett did say to Jokers one time, you're winning so easily, don't you ever think about adding to your game and going to the net? Well, one thing with Dave Fish, Retired coach from Harvard. Uh, you know, he hired our hired our group to lead his tennis camp for many years. Um, so I know Dave really well, Dave and Bonnie Fish. So two things. What needs to be regulated to improve American tennis, I guess tennis worldwide, but American tennis, is not in any order, but the two things are competition and instruction. You know, it, so my expertise is not so much in competition, but with instruction, the USDA does it with umpires. People travel around the country to evaluate umpires. We, we, we need the tennis police. You know, people talk about in society to defund the police. We need the tennis police. We need to educate the consumers. And, you know, okay, the grip police, palm up police. There should be some people that are walking around going club to club and Drop the hype, and there's somebody needs to tell the parents your kid has a Western forehand. You know, the elbow's pointing down, the racket's hitting their earlobe. Your kid has a palm up serve. And, you know, anyway, so how could, you know, that's one thing is that how could you regulate it with what we've assembled with the work of just say three, but we could mention, you know, Jacobson with stats, you get into, get into tactics, uh, you know, Jim Lair on the mental part, but just. I mean, Vandermeer with group dynamics. Like, how can you teach a lot of people one time so it's not so expensive? He was a genius at that. Oh, he had all the progressions and all the trickery. Uh, is the PTR really carrying the flag for what Vandermeer used to do? History. Uh, Braden, fact-based, science. And then just Welby Van Horn balance. So, no, I mean... Um, I mean, on the know, bright side, I do think it's potentially getting a little better. Hopefully... The efforts that you've made, you know, and the content that you guys put out and the content that others are stealing from you and putting out themselves, at least it's hopefully educating people. Yeah, we had a, a, so, for, a former intern here, uh, Riley Grossbaum, who we tease, changed the Grossbaum to Gross, Grossbaum, but a really dedicated guy, loves tennis. And, you know, he said that, yeah, you guys aren't getting credit for it, but People are using the information. And again, it's not, say, our information. Right, no, I get it. But, but at least, you know, if that, if their tennis intelligence level is increasing 25%, at least it's a step in the right direction. And hopefully they keep getting, you know, they're constantly trying to improve. I mean, I've watched a lot of these uh, pod. I mean, I've, like I've mentioned, I read, listen to some podcasts. I've, Rewatch certain elements of tennis intelligence applied. I remember joking with you for years that I, I couldn't figure out how to uh, unregister, so I must have paid for the thing for about three years, even though I watched it like three times. But um, you know, it's out there. I mean, it's if, if if you're really, and again, it just comes down to do the pros want it that badly, you know? And that's why probably in some cases, when you say it, pros, the teaching pros, teaching pros. So that's why honestly, it really should almost start with the parents. So almost the parents should be the ones that go out there and really study the content and put the pressure on the teaching professionals to know that. Yeah, I, you know, that uh, let, Tom Lausick, who's a guest on our podcast, he was here, he brought some uh, young, young kids that are you know, just, he's really good friends with the parents. And he was in a national tournament watching a couple of our kids play doubles. And he said he was talking to Roller to Hart on the sideline and, you know, that, there was a group of people not so far away. They were saying, oh, they're great base. And, and someone said, that's a cult. It, it's just amazing that uh, 
you know, fundamentals. And, pe- you know, the people that we have that support what we do, it's, they're just supporting the information. It's no fraternity. You know, it's, it's no, um, we're not the three musketeers or the 3,000 musketeers. But, no, we are, I tell people that um, we've gone from a snowflake to a snowball. We like to be a snowman, but tennis needs an avalanche. But it comes down to approving tennis teaching. You know, like who's going to stop the bleeding? You know, these young kids, it's an activity and they're really not being taught. Um, but, you know, tennis is, we, I mean, we're being invaded by pickleball. Tennis right. is a very difficult sport. All sports are difficult to, to excel at, but kids are going to be, grab a basketball and this is how you dribble, this is how you pass. And they're going to be in the ballpark. Same thing with the soccer ball. But they're, they're, they're not doing that like, okay, you two go rally a tennis ball. I can't do it. You know, and you're already at least in South Florida, like I've mentioned. You know, you're sort you've sort of seen sort of sectors of the city where the sport has just died out completely. Say that again. Where certain sectors of the city, you know, the numbers of tennis players have just dried up and disappeared almost. So it's basically it's gone at least in South Florida, Miami. It's much more eastward where the tennis is. Where back in the day. It was very spread out. I mean, you had players all over East, West. Doesn't exist out West anymore. Like I said, my high school, which, you know, I don't know how many state titles they won after me, because uh, we won none. They don't. They can't even feel the team anymore. So, and they're not the only ones. So, and it's not like the top players aren't choosing to play. There are no players in the area. So, you know, that's a. It's troubling, so it's only a matter of time until it just dries up completely, in my opinion. It's a scary thought. You know, it's like Sports Illustrated cover many, many years ago, yeah. tennis dying. You know, I talk to tennis coaches all the time, tennis pros, whatever, tennis trainers, whatever the title may be. And I ask, well, how many people are you catering to? And a lot of times the answer is around 20. I'll, like for myself today, yeah, we got a small group, 20 people. Well, one thing that we are doing, um, at one point, um, Tennis Intelligence Applied, you mentioned that, that was a course that we charged for. And I just didn't like, you know, Andy Fitzell, obviously the same, doesn't like what's going on with the tennis, the internet gurus, the subscription model. You know, here's the secret, you know, give me your credit card. But also, it's been a money grab. And, but I think really in the end, education, 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 the parents need to be educated, Tennis teachers need to be educated, and um, we, we really need to help tennis. And it's, I think, um, you know, Dave Fish put his, he put so much into promoting the UTR in the early years. Dave Howell put it together. Dave Fish is the one who really delivered it. And the, but the, how to regulate instruction. But you know what, I would love to have you on the podcast again. Um, we talked yeah. about even that this could be a two-parter. I think we got to sign off now, but but I, I mean, even if we just had a list of the podcasts we've had, in any instruction, there has to be a great review. I mean, that's where we, the type of podcast that we have. We don't want to be a magazine. We'd be like, we want to be a book. We want to have people that can add to the book. And you know, granted, um, you know, are there new frontiers in tennis? Um, you know. Ryan Reedy does a very good job. He was trained by Jim Klein, who was trained by me. And you know, not all the information that he's sharing is Vic Braden information. He could, that's just the way it works. I mean, he, he's, thir- he's third party, but he does a great job. And, um, but and again, does a great job. At one time he said, this is fantastic. He's, he's talking about videotaping. This is, this is great. There's nothing like that out there. And I go, Ryan, he's a great guy. You need to get his phone number call him. Hey, Ryan, no, 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 no. Um, Warren Pretorius, who was a guest on our podcast, we happened to be just changing batteries but on a camera. But he came to speak at our place. We had a weekend for coaches. And he, he said basically what Dartfish, you know, he was working with Dartfish at that time. And he said basically what Dartfish is doing was what Vic Braden was doing 30 years ago. Right. So... I think, again, too much ego, okay, I want to put my stamp on it, go, wait a minute, you know, we, we don't need to do that. It's like, 
Uh, we, we just need to get rid of the ego and rid of the greed. So let's do that by tomorrow at noon. Sounds good, Steve. Well, thank you for all these podcasts that you've uh, brightened my Wednesday, Wednesday mornings with. So it's a... Uh... No, thank you for being a podcast coach. We, we need the criticism. That's the only way to grow. Um, but we could do that. We could get together again and go, okay, let's have a little... Because I do think that this podcast... You brought up many points. It serves as a review. The, uh, Glad to help any way I can. Yeah, and you know, maybe one day we get the better looking brother. Get Jay, the better looking. Get, 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 get the better, better looking. Brother. Brother. I, had, I had to get that in. Had to no get worries. The, you know, no, he would love. I that. knew it was coming. Smarter brother too, right? Well, smarter, definitely. He I'm claims just, the SAT score I'm, will prove it. I'm just messing with you, but uh, anyway, everyone, thanks for listening. Another podcast, 102 in the books, and I uh, hope you got something out of it. Right. Andres Barbosa, thank you very much. Adios amigos. You understand that? Adios amigos. Good. Your Spanish is getting better. <laughs>